Accountability Committee as part of its inquiry into the New South Wales government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge that the land I'm on, the land the parliament is on, is Gadigal land and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and we pass, we give that respect as well to those uh, members and witnesses who are participating in the hearing today who are First Nations peoples and to those First Nations peoples who are uh, participating um, through this broadcast. Today's hearing is being conducted as a fully virtual hearing, which enables the work of the committee to continue during the COVID-19 pandemic without compromising the health and safety of members, staff and witnesses. As we break new ground with the technology, I would continue to ask for everyone's patience through any technical difficulties we have throughout the day. If participants do lose their internet connection, that includes members, um, then please rejoin through the link that's been provided to you by the Secretariat. Today's hearing will be focused on the New South Wales Government's plan and roadmap out of lockdown. We will first hear evidence from representatives of the Department of Premier and Cabinet and the New South Wales Treasury, and later from the Department of Education. The committee will then hear from Professor Jody McVernon of the Doherty Institutes, who is the Director of Epidemiology there. As you would be aware, the Doherty Institute has been critical in providing the modelling relied upon, at least at a national level, for the move, um, move out of lockdown. Uh, before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Whilst parliamentary privilege applies to, uh, to statements that are made in the course of the hearing, they do not apply to statements made outside of the hearing, and I'd urge all witnesses and members to take due care. Committee hearings are not intended to be a forum to make adverse reflections on individuals, so I'd please ask people, wherever possible, to stick to the issues, not the people. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness in accordance with the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. It's a matter this committee takes seriously. There may be some questions that a witness can only answer if they have more material to hand, um, or they can access other documents, in which case witnesses are able to take a question on notice and we'd seek a response within 21 days. I remind witnesses it is perfectly fine to provide an answer in less than 21 days. Today's hearings are being broadcast live from Parliament's website and a recording of the hearing will be uploaded to Parliament's YouTube channel after the hearing. As always, a comprehensive written transcript will be provided by Hansard. Finally, a few notes on virtual hearing etiquette to minimise interruptions and to keep this as smooth as possible. Can I ask committee members and witnesses uh, to, to ensure that they mute when they are not speaking and unmute prior to trying to make a contribution to the meeting? Can I also ask committee members to clearly identify who questions are directed to and ask everyone to please state their name when they begin speaking? Um, members should also utilise the raise your hand function when making points of order. Members and witnesses should avoid speaking over each other, if at all possible. And to assist Hansard, may I remind members and witnesses to, wherever possible, speak directly into the microphone. I now welcome our first witnesses. I note Ms. Wilkin and Mr. Walters, and I hope Mr. Walters is joining us. There have been some connection difficulties. But both Ms. Wilkie and Mr. Walters have already been sworn in at an earlier hearing, and I remind you both that you remain on that former oath or affirmation and do not need to be sworn again. So starting with you, Ms. Lushwitz, could you please state your full name and position title and then swear either an oath or an affirmation from the material provided to you by the Secretariat? Thank you. Natasha Lushwitz, Acting Deputy Secretary of Transformation Group for the Department of Premier and Cabinet. And thank you, Chair, I'll take the oath. I swear that the evidence about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thanks very much, Ms. Lushwitz. Ms. Dewa. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Fiona Dewa, Deputy Secretary, Strategy, Delivery and Performance at the Department of Regional New South Wales. I'll be taking the affirmation today. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thanks so much, Ms. Dewa. Do any of you wish to start by making a short opening statement? No, thank you, Chair. All right. In that case, I will hand over to the opposition uh, who will commence questioning on behalf of the committee. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for the witnesses for your attendance today. Um, Chair, if it's possible, I'm just going to direct these questions at first instance to the Treasury. And I think perhaps the etiquette is that I give Ms Wilkie the opportunity to decide whether she will answer or refer to Mr Walters. Uh, I just wanted to start by asking about the first initiative that the government has announced uh, as part of its recovery strategy, and that is West Invest, uh, that we, it was announced earlier this week. 
This is, of course, the fund that the government says will have $5 billion in it, and the Treasurer says it's the first stage of our economic recovery strategy, which the government is currently developing for release in October. Can I ask the first question, um, Pastor Ms. Wilkie, how many jobs do you expect West Invest to create? Uh, Mr. Mookie, the number of jobs that would be created by West Invest Welcome is going to, going to be dependent. Or meeting number followed by a hash. Um, sorry. Um, sorry, we might just. I think it's best we try and address this. I think that I think that's good news. I think it's Mr. Walters joining us, but I just might invite Mr. Walters, having joined us, to put himself on on mute. So your attendee ID or the numeric meeting password followed by a hash. Mr. Walters, if you can hear us, it would be um, of assistance to place yourself on mute. Sorry, Mr. Mookie, we will, I'll go back and return to you now. Thank you. I think the question, Ms. Wilkie, was how many jobs do you expect West Invest to create? And now that I get the chance to re-ask the question, over what period of time? Uh, Mr. Mookie, the, the number of jobs, um, uh, so at, the, at this point, uh, as far as uh, I'm aware, uh, Treasury doesn't have any, or the government doesn't have any expectations or estimates on that. Uh, it will be dependent on the exact projects that um, are invested in and um, those as per uh, the government's comments um, publicly have not yet been determined. Okay. so. Uh... This, this is a $5 billion fund, which is bigger than the state government's investment in JobSaver. But at this point, Treasury never modelled how many jobs it will create. Is that fair? Um, Mr. Mookie, the, the project, how many jobs um, an investment uh, will create, if I'm, talking in, if I'm talking about the way you would go about uh, an assessment uh, from an economic assessment of how many jobs would be created by any particular investment of government, uh, you do require some detail about the nature of the project um, and the nature of the investment. Um, and at this stage, the government has announced that it is going to put um, $5 billion into projects such as parks, urban spaces and green space, community infrastructure, local schools, creating and enhancing arts and cultural facilities, um, revitalising high streets, clearing local traffic. It's indicated that cost, um, that um, business cases uh, and those sorts of things will be required for investments coming out of that fund. And at this, at this stage, without that information on those projects um, and those business cases, uh, there is um, at this point no assessment of um, the number of jobs that would be created from this fund. Okay, I appreciate that, Ms. Wilkie, as an answer. And look, I have the same press release, which I think you might be making a reference to, in which that detail is stated about what the project, what the fund can be used for. So I might just ask, has the government or Treasury identified the first projects that will West Invest money will be used on? So uh, though the though so uh, not to my knowledge, uh, but I'm uh, I look after the economic. Uh, and strategic uh, productive uh, pro and productivity area of the department. Um, this this sort of uh, issue will will actually go through um, ERC processes, which is under a different area of responsibility uh, in the department. So I'm afraid I'll have to take that question on notice. Oh, look, I appreciate that, Miss Wilkie. But the reason I'm directing these questions to you is because the treasurer did identify this as being the first stage of the economic recovery strategy, which I think. Um, uh, you and Master Walters, I presume, have some involvement in. So I might just ask that question. W were you consulted, uh, Ms. Wilkie and or Mr. Walters, about the creation of West Invest prior to the Treasurer's announcement? So the the nature of these sorts of issues um, are um, in terms of the recovery plan, all of the department is involved in providing um, input to advice that goes to the Treasurer. That's true, but I'm asking perhaps specifically to Mr. Walters now, as the chief economist, did you design West Invest? I think you're on mute, Mr. Walters. No, um, sadly, we can't hear you now. Just can't. Now I can. Yes, you're back. Um, ah, ah. You got me, you got me now? now? 
I do. You are echoing. So I think we might have you, Stephen. I think we might have you on two channels, both on the phone and on the uh, the video conference. Now, might be probably. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Mr. Walters. Uh, so the question was you to you as the chief economist of New South Wales. Sorry, Mr. Mookie. I think uh, okay, Mr. nothing. Mr. Walters is not able to to hear you. Um, Ms. Wilkie, are you in a position to advise us or you specifically were not just in general input, but were you the designer? Was this the creation of Western Invest recommended by Treasury or was this created elsewhere in the government? Uh, that um, I'm not in a position to be able to answer that question. It's not, it wasn't, it's not part of my area of responsibility in the department. Well, did Treasury recommend the establishment of West Invest? That that goes to issues that are cab covered by cabinet and confidence material, okay. Mr. Wilkie, in terms I of. I won't press you, Ms. Wilkie. I appreciate that. Um, can I just then ask, where is the five billion dollars coming from? Again, this is not. I'm. I'm. I'll have to take that on notice. So, so. Uh, the, the treasurer was asked this at the press conference, and he made some reference to some distributions from the New, New South Wales Generations Fund which was a bit of a surprise because I don't think the Generations Fund legislation allows that to be used for this purpose. It only allows it to be used for debt clearance. So is this just money that's already in the budget that's just been given a new brand name or is it actually new money? I'll have to take that on notice. Okay, thank you, Ms. Wilkie. Um, do we know when the first project will actually start? Uh, well, until a project has been approved under the guidelines, then no, we don't have a start date. Okay. Do we know when the last project will be approved? If this is meant to be a announcement as per what the treasurer said to kickstart the economic recovery, when can the people of Western Sydney expect this to see this money and when will this money be finished? So the, the Details of uh, how projects are going to be approved are, are being um, developed. So consultation, eligibility criteria, assessment processes, all of those governance arrangements are being uh, worked uh, worked on and con under consideration by the government at the moment. Okay, but can we at least get a guarantee that this money is not going to be put to existing projects, but will it actually facilitate New projects, or is it simply the case that we've just rebadged what we've already got to spend and put it in this fund? The, the the projects that are going to be funded from this are going to be determined by the eligibility criteria that are being considered by government at the moment. Okay, so I've got two more questions on this before I pass to my colleagues. We might return to this as well later. Um, is this is this a special purpose account? What's its legal form of West Invest? I'll have to take point that. Of order, point, of order, Mr. point of order, Mr. Chair. Um, yes. I'm letting the Honourable Daniel Walker continue on for a while here, but when we look at what this inquiry is all about, it's about the government's management of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, whether this is a special purpose fund or not does not go to that point and whether this is a um, the management of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and really- I, I do I understand you. I understand your point of order, Mr. Fallow, and I don't think I need to hear from you, Mr. Mookie. This is clearly related to COVID-19. This is a fund that's been promised to assist um, uh, the communities in Western Sydney um, with the economic recovery following the lockdown directly related to COVID-19. And um, Mr. Mookie's questions are well within order. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Mookie, did you want me to restate the question or? Uh, I believe I answered it. I, we, oh, okay. You were asking about the legal status of the fund? Sure. Well, Restart New South Wales has its own legislation and its own governance requirements for the money to be used. Can we at least expect that West Invest is going to have its own law? So, Mr. Mookie, the West Invest and, and these sorts of structures and arrangements are not in my area of responsibility of the department. I will have to take this on notice for you. I appreciate that, Ms. Wilkie. My final question is, is in terms of the design of this, uh, the one I, I have from the publicly available information, um, the LGAs that are eligible to nominate projects, but the one that is missing is Bayside Council. And 
despite Bayside Council being an, an LGA of concern that's been su subject to special rules, was there a particular reason why Bayside was excluded and did Treasury recommend to exclude Bayside? I'll have to take that on notice, Mr. McKinney. Okay, I might pass to my colleagues and we might resume this in perhaps the next session if that's possible. Yep, as you do that, Mr. Mookie, I might just double check with Mr. Walters if you can hear us now. I can, Mr. Shrewbridge. Can you hear me? We can. It's a pleasure to hear your voice, Mr. Walters. I do remind you that you're, that you're on your former oath and or affirmation um, and you don't need to be sworn in again. Um, so welcome to the hearing and um, I'll now hand it back to the opposition. Thank you, Chair. And I might uh, just continue those questions to uh, Ms. Wilkie. Um, Ms. Wilkie, the Treasurer revealed this package had been under development as it was announced for six months. Uh, but as you've indicated, there's very little detail at the moment. Has Treasury been involved in this planning for six months? Uh, Mr. Graham, I believe the Treasurer's comment in relation to being under development for six months was not in relation to the West Invest Fund. But if you can tell me the the um, precise uh, uh, source of where you're quoting that from, then I will be able to check that. Yeah, well, perhaps on notice, if you could confirm when Treasury commenced work on this fund. Um, you've indicated that get the, Treasury... the source of that that statement, please, as well, so we can check that. Yeah, I'm referring to the public reports um, of this. I'm happy to provide on notice these specific ones I'm referring to. Um, turning to the detail of the fund, um, how much is allocated to each of the six line items, the six dot points in that release that my colleague referred to of the $3 billion? I believe that uh, at, as far as I am aware, uh, that is going to be um, part of, that's part of the governance arrangements that are still to be determined. Um, but yeah, any any further commentary would be speculation on that point. So I, I, we would have to wait for the government's arrangements to be agreed. Uh, turning to the sixth of those dot points, that is clearing local traffic. Uh, can you tell us what this actually refers to? What is uh, described here? My understanding is that further uh, clarity on each of those line items will be provided as part of the eligibility criteria for projects and the governance arrangements. One of the concerns about the um, uh, funding of West Connects was that many of the roads that lead on and off West Connects were not funded, um, where they were excluded from the $16.8 billion uh, funding. Is that what this money is going towards, uh, funding the local roads that lead on and off West Connex that communities expect were funded, but that the government has not funded? I referred to my previous answer. The The nature of, of these projects, will of what will be considered an eligible project um, is still to be determined. So that we'll have to take that one on notice as well. Right, and could you do so particularly in relation to dot point five as well, revitalising high streets? I took this as a reference to the existing Your High Street program, the $15 million DPIE program. Can you confirm that is the case, that this is an extension of that program? Take that on notice, yes. Right, thank you. Um, I might turn, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to be guided, Chair, about who this question is best put to, but I wanted to ask about uh, one of the concerns uh, about the nature of the lockdowns at the moment is a sense that it's been to Sydney's. The government has now changed the restrictions that citizens are under. Uh, however, for workers in lockdown LGAs, they still face many restrictions about the way they move around the city, the obligations they have that are different to the rest of the city, uh, can uh, either DPC or Treasury confirm whether or not that is expected to change? I think we might 
first go to Ms. Lushwitz or uh, Mr. Walters. Thank you, Chair. I can speak in a high level. I'm um, just in relation to, um, I believe you're referring to that um, there's an authorised workers list and that indeed the authorised individuals on the authorised workers list um, have certain set requirements in relation to their movement outside the local government areas of concern. You've also referenced that the government has recently tried to bring into parity, let's say, the restrictions that um, uh, the majority of greater, um, greater metropolitan Sydney are subject to um, in alignment more broadly with um, the air, local government areas of concern um, in relation to whether or not there will be full parity and or um, how those authorised workers um, continue to be, um, uh, how they manage going forward, I understand will be the subject of um, continued health advice into crisis policy committee and considered by them. But as we stand today, if we're looking at the roadmap, there's no indication about whether that there will be uh, an equal approach for those workers. There is now for citizens, not for workers. And um, there's no clarity about whether workers will be treated equally regardless of where they live in Sydney going forward as part of the roadmap. Um, the roadmap um, uh, obviously is in relation to um, the re relaxation of restrictions for double vaccinated individuals. That's that's statewide, but um, the Premier and the government has made clear that there's fine tuning um, and that health advice will continue to be referred to in relation to that. And in particular, where designated areas, um, that there's high caseloads um, in designated areas. Um, and so that's the current um, information available. On that roadmap, uh, when freedoms are reached, um, when we hit 70% vaccination and freedoms are extended to people across New South Wales, is it expected that each of those 12 LGAs will come out of lockdown or reach? Can you give us a guarantee that they will be out or will they be constrained by high case numbers in some cases? Um, in relation to their high case numbers, I, I can't make predictions in relation to that. Um, in relation to how they will be treated when it comes to the roadmap, um, Crisis Policy Committee continues to take on a um, multitude of advice, including health advice, and um, uh, that will form how those LGAs are considered um, at the time that we reach 70% vaccination. So as of today, under the roadmap, there's no clarity about that. Depending on high case numbers, lockdown LGAs might be allowed out or might not be allowed out when we hit the 11th of October. Is that correct? Um, I'd refer to my previous answer in relation to it. I can go through the roadmap as to what has been publicly stated. Um, again, going back to that, um, the government has indicated that it will continue to fine tune. Um, what has been announced in relation to that, it will take on board um, additional health advice. It will monitor um, the circumstances as they change and certainly if there's drastic changes in circumstances, it's obviously a very dynamic environment. Um, and if cases within designated areas remain too high, um, government will consider how the roadmap applies. I mean, that's certainly something which will be of real concern to people expecting freedom in these lockdown LGAs on the 11th of October. Um, I might uh, turn to another workers issue, and this is of real concern to the logistics industry, to hospitality, to obviously to healthcare, to a whole range of uh, industries in New South Wales, and that's the workforce rules about um, people who come into close contact or casual contact, even after they've been vaccinated. Um, and the concern there, of course, is that major bits of the workforce are um, uh, not available to work if they're uh, unable to work for 14 days after being a close contact. For double vaccinated uh, workers, is the government considering changing that, uh, those guidelines, the provisions, uh, this is one of the questions which industries have been really saying makes a huge difference to their ability to keep the doors open uh, once this roadmap kicks in. Uh, thank you, Mr. Graham. Um, 
agree that um, uh, New South Wales government agencies have been hearing from industries in relation to a multitude of issues. They have flagged um, the treatment of close and casual contacts, not just in relation to their workforce, but indeed to the um, individuals that they provide services to. Um, as part of the announcement on the 9th of September of the roadmap, the government did flag that they would be coming forward with updated advice um, that the, in relation to close contact. So they're considering, um, uh, I, I would say that how that's, that's managed is a matter for health. And I, I understand that um, uh, there are national considerations as to the approach and that they also rely on um, a multitude of inputs in relation to that, but the government has committed um, as part of providing more detail around the roadmap to come forward also um, with more detail as to how close and casual contacts will be dealt with. When Thanks, will that end? We will uh, we'll, okay. we'll return begin. to another round of opposition questioning, but Thank this, you. this round has expired and I hand over to Ms Boyd. Thank you, Chair, um, and good morning um, to you all. Thank you for being here. Um, oh, we've just clicked over into the afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, perhaps I could go to you, Ms. Wilkie, and just pick up on those um, questions um, that my colleagues were asking in relation to the new West Invest. Um, the $11.1 billion uh, coming in for the sale of the remaining stake of West Connects, when do you expect to receive that? I'll have to take that on notice, Ms. Boyd. It's not part of my area of responsibilities in the department, so I'm. I don't, I just don't have that information. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is it correct that when that money does come in, it will need to be put into the new generations fund? I will also have to take that on notice. It's not my area of responsibility. Um, it might help. Um, I believe you were there in estimates um, when this uh, new generations fund was being discussed um, with Mr. Pratt. And he categorically told us at that time that the sale from um, the second part of West Connex, that those monies would need to be put straight into the new generations fund. Do you recall that answer being given by Mr. Pratt? Uh, yes, but as I said, this is not my area of responsibility. I need to take this on notice. I'm not, it's not my area to comment on. I understand you may not want to, um, to comment. Uh, on something that's outside of your responsibility, but it would certainly be something you have knowledge of, wouldn't it? Uh, no, because I don't deal with this sort of information uh, and these issues on a day to day basis. They are dealt with um, by other deputy secretaries in the department. Understand. So, when we look at the statement from Mr. Pratt that that money would need to be put into the new generations fund. And then you look at the announcement um, from the Premier and the Deputy Premier that said, and I quote, um, the unprecedented boost was made possible by the state's strong financial management and asset recycling strategy with the New South Wales government today announcing the sale of its residual 49% stake in West Connects for 11.1 billion. Would you agree that that statement in the media or in the press release in relation to West Invest implies that there is new money coming in to the revenue, to, into general revenue for use in West, in West Invest? Ms Boyd, I'm not going to speculate or make dis, draw implications from material in, in a hearing of this nature. I will take the question on notice. I understand from your previous answers um, that there has been um, limited or there seems to be limited input from Treasury in relation to this in that um, you're not able to tell us um, any estimate of jobs, um, why certain um, areas have been excluded. We don't know what the eligibility criteria is. We don't even know really where this money is coming from. Um, is this more of just a communications release and a thought bubble than an actual fund? Ms Boyd, I believe you are um, taking a, um, an interpretation I have not intended from my comments. This is not my area dealing with the West Connect sale and the setup of the West Invest Fund is not my area of responsibility in the department. I do not have the level of detail to answer the questions you have been asking, which is why I have been saying I will take these questions on notice and the department will respond to you. To imply anything else from the answers that I have given would be wrong. 
I'm not implying, I'm asking you if it's correct and you're telling me that, that you'd have to take that on notice. Um, the uh, reference... Well, she's telling you that it's not correct. <laughs> and she's sorry, restating her sorry, opinion. Point order? Oh, sorry. I've, I've, I will ask members to come to order. Um, uh, Mr. Farlow, if you want to take a point of order, the best way is to raise your hand. Um, Ms. Boyd, I think Ms. Wilkie is endeavouring to be um, provide the information she can give in this hearing. I've always found Ms. Wilkie endeavours to provide the information fairly she can in the hearing as indicated what she needs to take on notice. Thank you. Um, just to help out my colleague previously, um, Mr. Graham was referring to the six months that the government has spent uh, working to develop the fund. Um, that comes from an article uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald dated uh, September 20. Um, but can I just confirm with you, and I do take that you, you're taking this on notice, um, but who in the department is responsible then? Uh, for West Connects or West Invest? West Invest. San Mita, the Deputy Secretary for Policy and Budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, perhaps I can turn then to ask um, some questions about the reopening roadmap. Um, and particularly in relation to, I understand that when it was first announced, there was a bunch of, of businesses um, that were grouped together, but without a huge amount of detail. Um, ha has that now been fleshed out? And I'm particularly interested in the reference to personal, um, I think it's, uh, it refers to hairdressers and nail salons um, and other businesses of that kind. Has that been um, expanded on so that we know, for example, where the beauticians are included in that? Um, is, who can answer that question for me? Uh, Ms. Boyd, it's Fiona Dewar. I'll take that question. Um, I think the group of businesses you're referring to um, have been referred to as personal services. Mm -hmm. In the public health order, personal services in the definitions is expanded to include uh, beauticians, nail salons, tattoo parlours, uh, hairdressers and a range of other businesses, but they are spelt out in the uh, public health order definitions. Thank you. I understand that that included sex services premises previously um, when we came out of lockdown last time. Um, does that include sex services premises this time? No, that's incorrect. Uh, sex services premises are, have a separate definition under the public health order. And when are they um, able to reopen under the um, proposed roadmap? So at the moment, I believe uh, they're referred to as intimate services under the public health order, and uh, as uh, they are not listed in the uh, settings advised by the government on the 9th of September. So, okay, so we don't know, is that what we're saying? We don't know when they will be allowed to open? What I'm saying is they're not in the, in the current 70% roadmap uh, for reopening. Thank you. Okay, I will take that up separately. Um, back to you, Chair. Thanks very much, Ms. Boyd. Um, Mr. Walters, do we still have you? We do, Chair, we do. Excellent. Um, have, have you, in your role as Chief Economist, um, had a look at what the economic cost has been so far of the lockdown um, um, following the most recent Delta outbreak from mid-June? I have. Can you give an indication about what the cost has been to the New South Wales economy? Uh, well, in general terms, uh, Mr. Shoebridge, it does vary depending on the level of restriction. Um, the Treasurer uh, announced, I think it was back in July, late July, that the weekly cost to the economy was $1.3 billion. Now, since then, um, there's been changes to the health orders that have included um, more of the state uh, being uh, restricted. But also since then, we've had an easing of restrictions in other areas, including in the regions. So that cost varies, but um, that's certainly the the um, uh, the treasurer's comment on 1.3 billion dollars was the numbers the treasury was assu assuming at the time. All right, but I'm asking you now, as the chief economist, you must be reviewing this closely. Um, what is your best estimate? of the cost to date? Well, the accumulated cost, that's a weekly cost. 
So that we're in week 13 of the lockdown now. So if you do um, a quick calculation of those numbers, it's in the realms of um, uh, if every week was the same, which of course they're not. So that, that's the problem with trying to say the total cost. If you're after a weekly cost, the current cost of restrictions is around that. But in terms of aggregate costs, we just can't aggregate that because restrictions change and different parts of the state have been in restriction, including construction, albeit briefly. So the 1.3 billion is, is um, the, the latest uh, information on the cost to the state is that 1.3 billion per week. So something in the order of $15 billion for now would be a ballpark figure for what the economic cost to date has been. Is that is that right? That, that's a figure that's been quoted by other economists. We, we don't have an aggregate cost because, as I said, the, the, the restrictions change, so the weekly cost changes. The advice we're giving to government on the actual number is cabinet in confidence because the restriction levels change. But um, the, as you said, the number that other, other economists have used, now I've not informed them of that number, but these are the numbers that they're using is somewhere around 15 to $16 billion, yes. But Mr Walters, you're the chief economist for New South Wales. You can't tell me it's a, it's a government secret what the actual cost to the New South Wales economy has been. You're not seriously telling me that that's a government secret covered by Cabinet in Confidence, are you? I am telling you it's Cabinet in Confidence, Mr Chair. <laughs> um, so so you, you sitting there now, you know what the cost, you have an estimate of what the cost to date is, is, is that right, which you've provided to Cabinet? That's correct. And, that's correct. And, you, and, and you're saying that's a, a state secret that you won't provide to the people of New South Wales covered by Cabinet in Confidence. Is that seriously your evidence? I'm saying it's Cabinet in Confidence, Mr Chair. Do, do, have you provided an assessment of um, um, what, the cost, what, what, what the likely cost will be to the New South Wales Government? Do we know what the cost to date to the New South Wales Government has been? You mean in the terms of the cost of the budget, not the economy? Correct. No, that's not in... I, I, I don't handle budget matters, Mr Shoebridge. I, I provide advice on the cost to economic activity and employment. Well, uh, I'll, the you, well, I'll stop you there and I'll, I'll throw it to Ms Wilkie. Uh, so, I, like the Chief Economist, my responsibility is in the economics area, not in the budget area. So, in terms of budget costs, um, those, I believe, have been provided to to ERC, but um, their cabinet in confidence um, and uh, in the responsibility of another area of the department. Well, Ms Wilkie, I'm going to ask you now um, what has been the cost to the New South Wales State Government budget of the lockdown since mid-June. Um, will you provide that? We'll take that on notice. Thank you. Um, uh, to, to, um, to probably Ms Dewa, the um, what if any um, support to actual individuals, um, um, uh, particularly those in Western and Southwestern Sydney, is being provided by the New South Wales government? And I might ask you to start with assistance in paying their utility bills, which for many households have gone through the roof while they've been living at home um, in lockdown and, and working from home in lockdown. What assistance is the New South Wales government paying so people can keep the power on? Um, look, thanks, Mr. Chair. Unfortunately, I can't um, go into detail around uh, support payments for individuals, businesses, or other. It's it's not the area um, that I, I look after. Well, is anybody from either Treasury um, um, or DPC able to provide any details about assistance provided to those people, especially in Western and Southwestern Sydney, who are just basically having trouble keeping the power on? given the extended bills they're getting as a result of lockdown. Can anyone provide any assistance in that regard? I'm going to take that as a collective no. Um, Mr Shoebridge, my, it's Mr Walters here. My, my advice is on a macroeconomic aggregate level. I, I can't provide an answer on specific measures like that. I'm not involved in those types of discussions. Well, Ms Wilkie, will you take on notice what, if any, assistance um, is being provided to individual households to deal with utility bills by the New South Wales government? 
yes yeah, so i can take i can take that on notice i mean it, again it's not it's not the responsibility of the payments to individuals and not the responsibility of the treasury portfolio area we deal with business support but i will take that on notice for you and i will ask ms lushwitz to um i'm um, taking on notice on part of department of premier and cabinet um and could you pay a particular attention to whether or not there's been any promotion of the new south wales government's energy account payment assistance vouchers and what if anything has and what the what has been what support has been provided under that voucher scheme um, since since mid June, Ms. Lushwitz? I can take that on notice, Chair. But I, I would prefer your original question was in relation to broad supports. Um, the New South Wales Gov.au website um, has that a, a page which lists all the support services provided um, to individuals. Um, uh, there are hardship payments available. There are test trace and isolate payments available. Um, uh, there is a number not just for South Western Sydney, but in particular Western Sydney supports go beyond financial supports, but indeed um, uh, uh, mental health supports. Um, obviously there are a lot of agencies that are working um, based on the needs of different communities. Multicultural New South Wales uh, continues to lead um, on specific community needs. Um, within, um, in particular, southwestern Sydney, Aboriginal Affairs has um, been working in Western New South Wales. Sorry, Chair, is that not? Sorry, Ms. Um, I, I was asking for um, how much has actually been paid to individuals. So, um, are you able I can to take that those? Um, I'm unable to provide that, but I'm happy to take that on notice. Um, Ms. Wilkie, is it true that not a single cent of the $5 billion that's been earmarked um, um, through the sale of Westconnex, however you wish to describe it, not a single dollar is going to be allocated to actual households, to help households? Uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, can you ask the question again? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, there's the $5 billion fund that's been announced by the Premier um, apparently to support Western and Southwestern Sydney. Is it true that none of that is going to be targeted to helping households who are having trouble paying their bills, and paying their rent as a result of lockdown? Not $1 is going to go in that regard. Well, the nature of the fund is that it's to provide investment to things like parks and urban spaces, the community infrastructure. So while so none of that in terms of what the government has announced the fund is likely to encompass it that is more in the space of investments in the community rather than direct payments to households uh, but those projects in and of themselves will benefit local communities so that there will be indirect benefits to households in those communities mr walters is new south wales treasury doing any any analysis of what the likely quantum of deferred rental payments, basically rental debt, um, that 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 has accrued during the lockdown, and whether or not any of that has paid particular focus to to Western and Southwestern Sydney. I can't answer on behalf of Treasury, Miss. Mr. Shoebridge, but I can say that I am not doing that sort of analysis, but I'd refer to Ms. Wilkie uh, for a broader Treasury perspective. All right. Well, Ms. Wilkie, I'll go to you and I'll ask both for deferred rental payments, effectively rental debt, but also deferred mortgage payments, mortgage debt. Has, is New South Wales Treasury doing any modelling there to understand what the scale of that debt will be, especially for Western and South Western Sydney as they come out of lockdown? So. Treasury has Treasury portfolio has responsibility for um, commercial and retail leases. So in the commercial and retail lease space, yes, we are looking into information uh, or looking as best we can at issues around rent deferrals and agreements between landlords and tenants um, through the commercial leases regulations and that sort of thing about what sort of uh, rent debts may be accruing, um, uh, but that's just in the commercial and retail lease space. Uh, we are not, we don't have responsibility for residential. 
um, and mortgage debt, um, although given the burden of an of an, of an aggregate level of, of macro of mortgage debt, um, the implications that will have for confidence and and economic activity, we are looking at that at a very sort of high level. Um, we're not we're not again. That's not something we look at in a great deal of detail, and in both of those cases. Uh, we're interested in how that is um, impacting across the state. Uh, you know that, that there are going to be regional impacts in, in regional areas, particularly those in the hospitality um, and tourism type industries, uh, where where there may be particular impacts around rental rental debt as well. So um, I think it's it's more true to say that we are we are looking at that issue um, in as much detail as we can. It's difficult to get data on that. Um, and we are interested in the the impact across the state, um, not just in one particular area or another. Well, could I ask you, do you have any figures um, that you can provide to us either on a, well, first of all, on a statewide basis, if it's limited to the commercial space, provide us with those figures. And if you have any granular data on a regional basis, can you provide that? Yeah, I'll have to take it on notice. I don't have that that data with me, um, and I I will just a, a lot of the data we we are able to access on that actually comes through um, the Small Business Commission and their um, responsibility for mediation. So um, I, we'll we'll look at what we have and and whether there's and make sure there's no privacy or other other concerns with providing that sort of data. So it may just come at a high level rather than any degree of granularity. But we'll we'll have a look and see what we can provide. We will come back to this, and and I just note that those privacy considerations, um, in in the face of the requirement to provide answers on Parliament, um, should be carefully reviewed. Mm. I'll hand over to the opposition now. Okay, you have committed the um, um the Sorry. Senate muting. I um. Forgive me. Uh, I might direct these questions to Ms. Dewa, um, or whoever is the senior representative of DPC. Uh, which minister is responsible for administering West Invest? Sorry, Mr. Mookie, uh, I'm from the Department of Regional New South Wales. Sorry, um, that might go to sorry, the other representative from DPC. Um, which minister is responsible for administering West Invest? I'm afraid. Um, uh, I'm afraid I don't know the structure of the announcement, and in terms of administrative responsibility, or if there are. Um, legislative responsibilities in relation to the fund, so I can't comment on that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I might ask Treasury, Miss Wilkie and or Mr. Walters, do you know which minister is in charge of this $5 billion fund? I'll have to take that on notice, Mr. Mookie. So the two ministers that were there for the announcement whose names are on the press release is Treasurer Perrottet and Minister Ayres, one of which is supported by Treasury and the other is supported by DPC. Do you know, is at least, are they the two ministers who are responsible for this or? I would just advise in relation to Minister Ayres, he is supported by um, Investment New South Wales and as such in relation to his responsibilities there. Um, some yes, of I know that Ms. Lichowitz, but that's a part of your cluster. You took it off the treasury, uh, your department did. So we know I'm, I'm across that. It's a really simple question. This is a $5 billion investment. Which minister is in charge of it? I think in relation, um, Mr. Mookie, you made clear that, um, as you're aware, that at the announcement, um, the Treasurer and Minister Ayres was there and they will certainly be involved in relation to it. If you're talking about administration of funds, that is something that I've said that I'm unable to provide advice on. I appreciate that. Can I now, um, now that we have the Chief Economist back, um, I'm just going to put the questions that I did put to the Chief Economist, but perhaps he didn't hear me. Um, Chief Economist, did you recommend the establishment and creation of West Invest? Uh, firstly, Mr. Mookie, I apologise for not being able to hear you earlier. Not your um, fault, Mr. Bush Bolt, it was not your fault. No, thank you. Um, no, no, I was not involved in the design of the fund. Did you have any input whatsoever in the design of this $5 billion fund? Uh, Mr. Mookie, my advice to government is, as I mentioned earlier, in general macroeconomic terms, not specific to funds or administration of, of proceeds of a sale of an asset. Okay. Um, but it's just that I, I press the question again to you and Mr. Wilkie, but the reason I ask is because, Ms. Wilkie, you're the Deputy Secretary of Economics and Strategy. 
And Mr. Walters is the chief economist. Yet the impression that we are getting is that neither of you are involved in the establishment of this $5 billion fund. So is this actually important to our economic recovery or not? Uh, Pat, again, Mr. Mookie, if I make some general comments about, we know that um, large parts of Western Sydney have been uh, adversely affected by the Delta outbreak of the pandemic in particular. So um, I'm supportive of government um, doing what it can to support uh, the families and businesses in Western Sydney. I think that's very important, but that's the kind of advice I give to government. It's, it's high level advice. I appreciate that. And I want to be very clear, I'm not being critical of you or Ms. Wilkie at all. I'm just trying to understand how this decision was made because this is a fund that is bigger than JobSaver. And I want to know whether or not the chief economist has said that it's vital for restoring jobs in Western Sydney. Uh, stimulus to parts of the economy adversely affected by the pandemic is an important part of the recovery process. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Wilkie, the Treasurer said this investment is the first stage of our economic recovery strategy, which the government is currently developing for release in October. Are you leading the development of that strategy? Uh, that strategy uh, is being led by Sen, uh, the Deputy Secretary for Policy and Budget, Sen Mittal. Chief Economist, are you involved in the development of that strategy? I provide, uh, again, general advice uh, through Mr. Midhar into the task force responsible for that project, yes. So why is um, he... Okay, I appreciate that. Look, um, uh, what I won't press it further in that context. What I will ask, just a few more questions about this. Um, the other LGA that was excluded was George's River, uh, despite them being a LGA of concern. They're not eligible for it. Is there any light that can be shed as to why they've been excluded? We'll take that on notice, Mr. Mickey. Appreciate that, Ms. Wilkie. The other point is, is that we've established that $3 billion can be used for the six matters that are referred to in the Treasurer's press release. It says that the remaining $2 billion will be reserved for high priority projects to be developed in consultation with local communities. How is the government intending to consult those local communities? Uh, as the um, media release uh, and and other government comments have been made clear, those uh, consultation, the, the nature of those consultations and how those consultations have been going to be conducted, like things like the eligibility criteria are under consideration by government at the moment. So I'm concerned that, uh, and I'll direct this to you and DPC, either of you who wish to answer, but what, what assurance can you give us that the consultation for this $2 billion is going to be a lot better than the consultation which led to the Stronger Communities Grants Program? That's to DPC and Treasury. I mean, right now we're talking about a serious amount of money here. What confidence can you give us that this is going to be governed better than the Stronger Communities Grants Program? Mr. Mookie, I can't make any comment in relation to your assertion in relation to the um, Stronger Communities process. Ms. Wilkie has outlined the process for. Um, uh, how the government will determine consultation with the community around the um, uh, fund that you're now speaking in relation to. Look, this is the last question I want to ask. I'm just going to put this to you because right now the impression that's been given is that we have $5 billion being spent on a program. We don't know how many jobs are going to be created. We don't know which minister's in charge. We don't know when the money's going to be spent. We don't know when the money will run out. It looks like this is not a policy, it's a press release. Can you give us any sense that this is actually a well thought through strategy or is it instead a distraction for the fact that the government broke its promise about privatising WestConnex? Point of order, point of order, Mr. Chair. Um, none of these witnesses- I, um, I note your point of order and I think I know the thrust of it. Well, well no, no, let me say the point of order. None of these witnesses have responsibility for this program, which they have all indicated throughout this hearing. It is very unfair for Mr. Mookie to put such a proposition to any of these witnesses before Mr. the committee. Mr. Farmer, Mr. Farmer, I'm going to invite Mr. Mookie to put the question again, noting that these are um, 
um, departmental witnesses. They're not responsible for the policy. They can speak to its practical um, um, practical impl implementations, but um, they, they, they're not responsible for the policy. So if you might I'll just, just focus I'll your just attention on the question. question. I'll just put it this way. Can you give us any assurance that this is actually a policy and not a press release that reflects a strategy for economic recovery for Sydney's West? Mr. Mookie, as the Chief Economist has already indicated, a policy that uh, a government decision of this nature where a significant amount of money is going to be directed for investment into a part of the state that has been um, disproportionately affected by um, the pandemic is appropriate in terms of economic recovery. Thank you. I'll pass to my colleagues. My turn uh, back to Ms. Lutwich, if that's okay, from Department of Premier and Cabinet, just to return to those questions I was asking about workers uh, in particular, double vaccinated workers who might come into close contact, come into casual contact with COVID cases and the fact that you've told us the government will uh, has said it will change those guidelines. Uh, when will that occur? We're now 11 working days away from when we might open the doors on the 11th of October. Uh, when will the hundreds of thousands of businesses who are relying on this information to plan find out what the new guidelines are? Thank you, Mr. Graham. Um, uh, in relation to uh, updated advice in relation to close and casual contacts, the government has said it will issue revised um, guidance and that it will do that closer to the date of reopening. Can you give us some assurance that the more than 300,000 businesses who need this information in the private sector to do their job won't find out the midnight before in the public health order what the rules of the game are here? Um, I just refer to my previous answer. The government has said closer to the reopening date, it will make that updated guidance available. Turning to that reopening date, uh, there's been repeated references publicly to the fact that we might hit the 70% vaccination rate on maybe the 7th or 8th of October and then open on the 11th. How is that modelling being done? Is it being conducted by New South Wales Health or are we perhaps relying on federal modelling or is it something that DPC or Treasury is in charge of? Sorry, I'm just a bit unclear in relation to the modelling. Are you referring to modelling as to when we will hit the 70% double vaccination? Precisely. Um, I'll make some preliminary statements. Um, perhaps Ms. Duo would like to make some additional. Um, the New South Wales government um, is very transparent with how it is um, tracking against um, uh, single and double doses. Um, and um, there are various extrapolations in relation to um, uh, the gross over seven day periods, et cetera. Um, as such, there are, are many commentators who are making uh, assumptions and assertions as to what that date is. Um, in terms of vaccination supply, that is a matter for the Commonwealth. Um, and um, uh, New South Wales um, has a role in some of the delivery of that. And um, uh, My vaccine. question is, who, who, who is in charge in the New South Wales government? of conducting that modelling about when that, that all important date about when things might open. Who is the agency in charge? Um, I, I, I guess I would say that again, um, with Commonwealth responsibility for supply, that's one of the inputs. Uh, New South Wales Health are obviously intrinsic um, to uh, some of the delivery in relation to that. Um, and. I would say that they're best placed to provide uh, information in relation to um, uh, our, the modelling in relation to when we would hit thank, the Thank you for process. that answer. If you could perhaps take on notice the arrangements, the agency arrangements about that modelling as uh, this continues. Can I turn now to the issue about outdoor uh, dining? I might direct this again, Ms Lutwich, to you in the first instance. Uh, the government has moved to uh, liberalise outdoor dining, although really only in the rocks and um, for 240 businesses in the city of Sydney. Much of the rest of Sydney, um, much of the rest of the state, 
none of the rules have changed. On October 11, in 11 working days, uh, outdoor becomes crucial to safely operating and for hospitality businesses, outdoor activity will be at one per two metre squared. Uh, people will be allowed to stand up and drink as an example. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. None of this uh, preparation has occurred outside of the CBD, especially the rocks, for businesses to do this. Will the rules change? What support is there for businesses to move outdoors? Health says it's safe, uh, but these businesses don't know uh, what the rules of the game are from government. Will anything change between now and October 11? Sorry, there are a lot of questions in that one. Um, in relation to the 11th October date, um, that's a date that you've put on. There's the government hasn't said that. The government has said I, that. I accept that. Yep. Um, uh, uh, in relation to, will there be any changes ahead of the commencement, say, of um, the official commencement of the roadmap and the relaxation of restrictions? The government has continued to take um, on board a variety of different inputs and indeed health advice and and um, how um, the pandemic is tracking against different LGAs and uh, have made amendments reflective of that um, when the advice to them is that it is safe to do so. Um, I cannot comment in relation to um, what additional information may be go before Crisis Policy Committee turning, before thank you for now and a 70%. Thank you. Turning to that West Invest Fund, uh, it's been six months in development, according to the Treasurer, and I thank my colleagues for pointing out that Herald article on the day uh, after it was announced. Um, was DPC involved in the six-month development of this West Invest scheme that so far is just six dot points on a press release? Um, I can't um, uh, speak to, in my role as Acting Deputy Secretary for Transformation Group in relation to um, my engagement, um, but indeed with Minister Ayres um, being supported more broadly by DPC and um, uh, in particular by um, Investment New South Wales, I can take on notice in terms of um, where in DPC that engagement uh, could have occurred. And finally, can you, um, uh, yeah, well, if you could take that on notice, that would be uh, very welcome. Could you also take on notice who are the ministers, given the problems we've had with grants under this government, who are the ministers who will have final decision-making authority for each of these areas uh, that are covered by this fund? Sure. I think um, that was already taken on notice in relation to a question from the chair around um, ministerial responsibility for the fund. So again, I can confirm that question will be taken on notice. It's a slightly more specific question, given that we found that the ministers who are responsible for administering aren't always the final decision makers for the fund. Uh, so if it could be taken on notice as a separate question. Thank um, you, yes. Mr. Graham, that's a slightly more refined question. Um, ends the opposition's round and I'll hand over to Ms. Boyd. Thank you. Um, I've just oh, got sorry, a couple Ms. more. Boyd, be before, um, I do apologise, just to the witnesses, we are going to um, trespass on your time for about 10 minutes additional to what we had um, originally proposed because we were so somewhat delayed in getting started for technical reasons. If anyone has a difficulty with that, please let me know now. Um, but I'll hand over to you, Ms. Boyd. Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of extra questions about this West Invest to the extent that you can answer them. Um, and so perhaps I'll direct it to you again, Ms. Wilkie, um, because I would like you to take it on notice if you if you can't answer. Um, but in addition to those two um, LGAs of concern uh, that Mr. Mookie mentioned that were not included within the West Invest um, remit, we have an additional five um, LGAs that have not been of concern during COVID that have been included in West Invest. Are you able to shed any light on the rationale for including those? I'll take that question on notice, Ms. Boyd. Thank you. Um, are you able to tell us what sort of up-to-date data um, the Treasury collects in order to work out the economic impact in those LGAs? Or is it, I guess, surmised from the circumstances? Uh, so I, I can start answering this question and then I might hand over to Mr. Walters, who's much, much closer to this. There's 
a range of data, real real time data to the extent that, that real time data exists for the economy um, and then economic statistics um, that are taken into account. So things like um, uh, mobility data, whether that's uh, transport for New South Wales data for Opal card usage or um, Google mobility and Apple mobility data um, and that sort of thing. Uh, there's credit card expenditure data um, that we use in terms of those, those real time numbers. Um, and then there's various other economic statistics that we get through the um, Australian Bureau of Statistics, the con consumer and confidence numbers that we get through various other institutions. Um, the problem or the, the issue with a lot of that data is that some of it we can get down to an LGA or sub LGA level. A lot of it is not available at that sort of geographic level. So um, we have, uh, so in terms of being able to monitor things in real time, um, data availability is, um, is difficult to, to be able to look at the, um, you know, in, in terms of what the actual impact is, makes it difficult to look at it at anything less than a really a broad state level. But um, Mr. Walters, is there anything you'd like to add to that answer? Oh, look, I think that was a very comprehensive answer from Ms. Wilkie. The only thing I would also add, Ms. Boyd, is that we get feedback from business regularly mm -hmm. and other groups. So we're always talking to stakeholders who may be affected. So in addition to all the data uh, that Ms. Wilkie mentioned, both official Bureau of Statistics data plus bank card data plus mobility data, which are all very useful, we do get real-time business feedback as well, which gives us that real-world perspective on the published data. Thank you. And do you get data about how many businesses are effectively closing down or, or won't be able to reopen once the um, once we come out of COVID? Well, that that tends to come more in a qualitative sense through the business feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, the data on um, official business closures or insolvencies uh, is very dated. So, mm -hmm. as Ms. Wilkie said, it's it's not particularly uh, useful for regional analysis or uh, statewide, even for that matter. Um, a lot of that information uh, comes from the corporate regulator, which is a national body. Mm. So, the answer, it's more to a, my simple answer is it's more qualitative than quantitative. Okay. Um, and do we know how many um, people are engaged in the construction sector, so have jobs in the construction sector um, in the LGAs that are covered by West Invest? We, we... Uh, I'll give a general. Sorry, you go, Ms. Walkie. Sorry, Stephen. Um, uh, we do have that. Uh, we do have um, various data sources. You know, the ABS data in terms of industries or employment. Um, that 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 mean we can uh, make calculations to work that out. But that data is dated, in the sense that it's all you know it's retrospective data. Thank you. I'm just looking again at the press release in relation to West Invest and the projects that have been identified are all construction projects of various kinds, some small scale. And then, of course, that 2 billion that might be reserved for um, for larger construction projects. In your view, as economists, is that the most effective um, uh, use of funds in order to sort of re-stimulate the economy after opening up after COVID? So I'll I'll start, and then Stephen might want to pick up. So, if you look at the types of projects that are um, envisaged there, you've got everything from you know um, urban spaces and and schools and cultural facilities and that sort of thing. The there are going to be very large parts of the of um, business, very large parts of the economy and businesses that are going to be engaged in that. So everything from if if a park is going to be revitalised, then you're going to be engaging um, potentially um, construction industry if you're redoing paving on footpaths and that sort of thing. But you're also going to be engaging landscaping and um, you know plant supply businesses and and all of that sort of thing. So. So at school, you know, if we're modernising local schools, then again, yes, the construction industry is going to be engaged, but you're potentially also um, engaging a variety of other businesses through 
um, through the, the various things that are going to be done in schools um, and that sort of thing. So, so um, the one of the benefits of the construction of in, investing in these sorts of projects where you're building is that the multiplier through the economy, um, particularly once you start looking at the supply chain um, to, to undertaking those sorts of investments, you do end up engaging quite a large part of the economy. Would you not get, um, I'd put it to your... Uh a more direct um, boost to the economy by actually putting more money in the hands of people who will then spend um, locally in local businesses? So, um, and Stephen will be able to give a more technical answer here, but in general, uh, the multiplier um, for so the you know the amount of money that you end up the amount of economic benefit that you end up getting um, is higher for investment um, than it is for consumption. So if you gave money directly to people, um, then they will go out and buy something. If you give it to a business, they pay workers, they pay suppliers, and so there's more there's more interactions going on in the economy. But given that you've I got, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to add, Ms. Boyd, to Ms. Wilkie's answer that uh, totally, um, as Ms. Wilkie said, that the highest multipliers are typically in government investment, uh, particularly in infrastructure. There are positive multipliers involved with giving um, people grants, so to speak, households, but the amount of money that actually gets churned through the economy, which is what we're ultimately after, depends on a whole range of factors for those households, including their propensity to spend money. Uh, particularly high income earners have a low propensity to spend money. Lower income earners have a higher propensity to spend money. So it's a much more complex concept than just giving people money. We know that the, the multipliers associated with infrastructure spending uh, are typically much, much higher than those for households. Well, we're on a unity ticket, Mr. Walters, of not giving money to high income earners. Um, uh, uh, yes. Unity ticket we with Treasury. <laughs> I guess um, you know there's there's extreme um, cost of living pressures on people in these um, areas of concern. Um, not least of all, the high cost of tolls um, for people living uh, in the western um, suburbs. Would it not be more sensible to ease the cost of living um, for people in those impacted areas rather than um, putting money into even more um, construction projects? The the multiplier effect or the the broader benefit to the economy uh, for for those two different types of expenditures, as Mr. Walters has indicated, is highly dependent on the circumstances. Um, if if an if government invest is investing in um, infrastructure in in a region that that where that infrastructure is is poor. And that is going to have an enormous benefit to to the economy more broadly. So it's it's uh, you know to ask that it's highly dependent on the circumstances. Um, and you know I, I can't you know it it depends. Is the Thank you. My final question then is just given how little data we have on what's actually happening in those LGAs, um, given how dependent any recovery financing is. Um, in terms of its effectiveness on the circumstances, as you've said, do you believe that you are in the best position to be able to, um, I guess, advise the government um, that investing in construction is the best way to go at this time? So, the um, as an economic policy advisor, uh, you never are in a, you never have all the information you would want. Um, or that you feel you might need, um, and any expenditure of money, uh, there's an opportunity cost associated with that. Uh, so, at this point in time, given the information that we do have, both anecdotal and quantitative, in terms of the impacts on Western Sydney, um, it's not it, it is appropriate for the government to be to be looking at ways as part of the economic recovery. Um, to make sure that it makes investments into that community. Um, and, and as we've said, um, 
in general, economic policy advisors are generally going to prefer um, expenditure in, in, you know, given a, a paucity of other data, will prefer expenditure on investments um, rather than consumption uh, because they tend to have a higher multiplier. Thanks, Ms. Boyd. Um, Ms. Wilkie, you, you said you were looking at some of the, um, the regional impacts, the economic impacts. Have you got any data or any, can you provide us with any insight into how some of those regional economies, which are so tourism dependent, and I'm thinking here the North Coast, the Mid Coast and the South Coast, how they've fared as a result, not only of their own lockdowns, but of, lock, but of border closures and the lockdown in Sydney? Uh, we do have some information, and um, and as Steve and I have both indicated, I mean, part of the part of this comes from the anecdotal information that we're getting, um, and we are eagerly anticipating future data releases from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, so we can part, start putting some some degree of of rigor and quantification around that. So. Uh, we do, but we do have some information that is starting to point to to those areas of concern. Um, in fact, we one one we do know is of greatest concern is actually that it's the Sydney um, Central Business District that is the most highly impacted um, region of any in New South Wales um, for some of those same reasons, including tourism and visit visitors from outside the area. Um, so we will. I don't. I don't have that to hand right now in terms of that sort of level of detail. So I, I'm very happy to take on notice to provide you with um, some of the information that we do have. Noting that, um, you know, as more data releases come out over the next six months, we'll have a much clearer picture. Thanks, Ms. Wilkie. Is there work on 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 foot to have a stimulus package ready to go for those tourism dependent economies? And I'm particularly thinking about small and medium businesses in the regions, where if they go to the wall, there's going to be that ongoing impact of economic pain with unemployment. Seems to me a matter of urgency. Can you give us any assurance that there is a stimulus package in the pipeline to help particularly those tourism dependent economies? So the the business grant support that's already available um, is is obviously available to businesses across New South Wales if they if they have experience, if they're eligible in terms of experience decline. So those businesses in those sorts of circumstances at the moment um, are already eligible for support. Um, but in in terms of the recovery package that the treasurer is putting together, um, the notwithstanding the fact that one of my colleagues is leading that process, as Stephen's already indicated, there's a significant amount of work that is coming out of the economic teams in terms of trying to identify various different cohorts, um, whether it's geographic or industry, so industry sector based, um, or uh, looking at, you know, those um, cohorts who are employed who um you know like employment based like younger people and that sort of thing so that they that the recovery package can be targeted to the to the cohorts across the economy that have been um disproportionately affected Ms. Wilkie, can, can you provide us on notice how much has been spent on um, how much has been allocated and spent under the current business support grant program and if you can break it down by region uh Yes, we, we will be able to do that on notice. Uh, the Service New South Wales website provides the inform information on the amount of um, applications that have been paid out to date, but it doesn't include that geographic information. So, um, yes, we will be able to take that on notice. Mr. Walters, my, my final, final two questions go to you. For a stimulus package such as the West Invest package to be effective, it needs to be new money, doesn't it? It can't be rebadged or repurposed funds from other programs, is that right? Well, it depends on many, many factors, Mr. Shoebridge, I would argue that, as Ms. Wilkie said, there's an opportunity cost. It mm -hmm. depends um, what government uh, alternative spending options are. Um, but but typically, um, new but, money I'm would... Sorry, would Mr. Wilkie, you, you can't just rebadge existing payments or existing investments and pretend it's a stimulus package. For a stimulus package to be real, it has to be new money, doesn't it? Depends on the multipliers, Mr. Shoebridge. If it was coming off uh, spending that had been allocated to a low multiplier project, for example, or a purpose, and it's put to a higher multiplier purpose, then the same money allocated to a higher multiplier would have a stimulatory effect. Well, what about the fact... Yeah. All right. 
What about the fact that ultimately every single cent of this, one way or another, is going to be paid for by the people of Western Sydney through tolls over the next 40 years? Um, it's effectively a mortgage that they're paying and they'll pay out um, um, to the private provider over the next 40 years. Does that fundamental underpinning, does, does that impact in terms of what its economic benefits will be if the people of Western Sydney are not dupes and they understand that effectively they're going to pay for this anyhow? Is that going to have adverse impacts? I, I can't comment specifically on the funding or uh, whether it's through tolls or otherwise, Mr. Shubish, I'm not, I'm not involved in the transactional side of, of the department. Well, the only way you make money on a toll road is through tolls. Um, so the people of Western Sydney are going to be paying the purchase price one way or another, aren't they, Mr. Walters? I mean, that's a fun, you're a chief economist, you know this. Well, I would argue drive, all users of those toll roads will, will pay a toll, not just those people in Western Sydney. But again, I, I don't, I'm not involved in the specifics of this project or its funding, Mr. Shoebridge. So I'm happy to take that question on notice, but I, I can't answer it for you now. Well, so what I specifically want you to take on notice is, have you taken into account that, that, that that's a more complex interaction? If the people of Western Sydney realise that they're going to be paying every cent of this anyhow, they may well choose to actually save money and put them aside for the future. That may well have a very adverse impact, mightn't it, which would go some way to negate the, ec the economic stimulus of the $5 billion, mightn't it? Uh, if savings are increased or spending deferred, then in general terms, yes, the, the stimulatory impact could be affected. But again, I, I can't make a comment in, in uh, specific reference to this project. All right. Um, um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I've gone a little bit over, and I do thank all of you for staying on. Um, 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 we all appreciate um, the assistance you're able to give. We look forward to further assistance in the answers to questions on notice, and I remind you all you have 21 days in which to provide those. And, of course, as always, the Secretariat um, uh, will be providing you with assistance and details in that regard. Um, so um, thank you to all the witnesses. Um, we will now have a short recess until 1.45 p.m. when we will come back on and be looking at um, um, education and schools and how COVID-19 um, is impacting upon the return to schools. So thanks everybody. I again remind members that unless you want people to have an insight into your domestic life, I suggest you turn the video off and place your um, device on mute. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome, witnesses. Uh, my name is Stephen from the Secretariat. Um, I might just do a quick audio test, if that's okay, uh, starting with Ms. Harrison. Hi there, yes, how are you? I'm um, well, thanks. Got you loud and clear. Uh, Ms. Owen? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, Ms. Katia? Yes, hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, very well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manning? Yep, I'm here. Got you loud and clear, thank you. Uh, Mr. Dizda? I'm here and present. Got you clearly. Uh, Mr. Martin? Uh, I'll try that again with mute off. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, thank you. All right, um, I will uh, ask you all just to Put yourselves back on mute until um, the chair uh, says hello, I suppose. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all again. <laughs> Hello. 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 Well, I'd like to now formally open our second panel and give a welcome to our next witnesses. Firstly, can I note Ms. Harrison, Ms. Owen, Mr. Dizdar, and Mr. Martin. You've already been sworn in at an earlier hearing, so I just remind you, you remain on that former oath and or affirmation and don't require to be sworn in again. <clears throat> so starting with you, Ms. Kachia, if you could please provide your full name, your title, and then take either an oath or an affirmation, the Secretariat should have provided that to you. Thank you very much. My name is Yvette Kachia. I'm the Chief Papal Officer. Deputy Secretary at the New South Wales Department of Education, and I'd make the following affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thanks very much, Ms. Katia. Uh, Mr. Manning. Um, Anthony Manning, Chief Executive, School Infrastructure. Uh, the affirmation I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm. That the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, again, thank you all for your attendance today. Uh, there, there's an opportunity now, should you wish to take it, to give a brief opening statement. Um, Ms. Harrison, Mr. Martin. Uh, yes, Chair, if I'm, I may, that would be uh, gratefully received. Can I first acknowledge that I join you from the land of the Camaragal people and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging? Um, I appreciate the opportunity to outline the department, uh, the department's current priority and focus, which is the safe and secure return to school and early childhood education. I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to our staff uh, and our school communities who, through the last term, um, have shown incredible resilience um, and agility in supporting their communities through this experience. And in particular, uh, those those schools in southwestern Sydney and western Sydney who have uh, gone above and beyond in support of their communities through very challenging times. The COVID pandemic, uh, and in particular the Delta variant, has significantly impacted life as we know it across all communities in New South Wales. The disruption, circumstances and experiences within the education sector have proven challenging and have required sustained focus. The task of living with COVID requires that that focus continues. This will be done in partnership with our students, teachers, parents and carers, who have all shown such tenacity, patience and resilience over many months now. 
The department's efforts have been and will continue to be guided by health advice and the growing research and evidence base uh, that is developing around the world as countries grapple with many of the same questions that we are experiencing here in New South Wales. We know our students learn best in the classroom and we know parents and schools need clarity after many uncertain months. This is why we are planning for a staggered return for all schools from next month under the COVID safe conditions. As the committee is no doubt aware, the return to school plan comprises multiple measures to mitigate the risk of COVID-19 transmission. These include mandatory double doses of vaccinations for all school and preschool staff, encouraging vaccinations of students aged 12 and above, staggered start and finish times and breaks with no mixing uh, between student cohorts, mandatory mask wearing for all school staff and high school students, and masks strongly recommended for primary school students. An audit of ventilation in classrooms across all public schools is underway, and we continue to ensure the provision of hygiene supplies and enhanced cleaning across our school sites. These measures are responsive to and tailored specifically to the New South Wales experience and context. The return to school plan provides for localised application that takes into account the specific and unique circumstances of our 2,200 different schools across the state in the interests of every student. Looking forward, the challenges set by COVID-19 will be ongoing and dynamic. So too will be our management of the situation in schools. Our responses will not be static or fixed. We will adapt and evolve as we monitor and learn. We will respond to the evidence base and expertise as circumstances demand and as risks require. This is our new business as usual, as we seek to re-establish a fundamental schooling normal to provide a safe environment for our students to learn and our teachers to teach. I note that we are uh, operationalizing the return to school plan from the 25th of October. We may not have all details finalized as yet, but we will seek to answer the committee's questions as thoroughly as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Harrison. Um, does any other witness wish to make a brief opening statement? No? Well, then I will hand over to the opposition to commence questioning. Thank Ms. you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, can I too put on the record my sincere thanks to the teachers and staff at our 2,200 New South Wales schools who have gone above and beyond during the, um, during the closure period? Um, Ms. Harrison, I note that all schools are planning to return, and I note that, that that terminology has been used, they're planning to return on the 25th of October, the 1st and then the 8th of November. What would be the criteria for any schools not to return on those dates? Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Husos. It's Georgina Harrison for Hansard. Um, we will be taking health advice leading up to the return to school on those areas that can uh, return. As we've said, uh, we are planning for all school schools to return. We uh, very hope we are very strongly hopeful that is the case and that we're able to proceed on that basis. Uh, but we will continue to be led by health advice uh, on which areas that will apply to at the time. There was a discussion in budget estimates that the CDC guidelines of 50 cases per 100,000 would be used. Is that still being considered? Uh, it's definitely being considered. Uh, I think it's important that as we look around the um, situation that our schools are reopening in, one of the things we are trying to make sure we do is maintain world class standards. We will have some of the highest vaccination rates in the community at the point students are returning. Uh, we will have relatively by global case by global standards, low case numbers statewide. But obviously, where we have particular risks in particular areas, we need to make sure that we are responding to those. And so, yes, the CDC uh, level remains a consideration. And will that consideration be announced as part of the announcement on the first week of October? Uh, and so that will be a matter for government in the first week of October and subject to decision making by Crisis Cabinet. So in terms of the consideration about the caseload, are you at the moment considering that for specific local government areas or are you looking at school districts? What's the, what's the level of community transmission that you're looking at? And so we are continuing to uh, be in dialogue with New South Wales Health around the appropriate settings, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to uh, preempt what those discussions might uh, end up with. But certainly we are looking at the case numbers in communities and we will continue to work with New South Wales Health to get to a final position. I mean, this is the crucial question is whether students will be able to return to school according to the publicly announced timetable. And parents and teachers and students are looking for clarity. Student schools within the same local government area are receiving conflicting information about whether they are going to return or whether they're not going.
and to return, you do understand that this is an incredibly important piece of information to share with the public. Uh, yes, Ms. Huzos, we absolutely understand uh, the demand and uh, necessity for clarity in our school communities. We are, however, uh, working through an evolving situation with a global pandemic. And so we are making decisions on the best advice that we have at the time and in the most timely way that we can uh, to support safe ret the safe return to school. So I absolutely understand the frustration and uncertainty that may cause. But I am also sure the community will appreciate the need for us to respond to the settings as they are at the time we're making those decisions. Are you considering any other, there's the CDC guidelines, are you considering any other international guidelines? Uh, so that is the main one that we are considering at this stage. Um, alongside the other community uh, areas that we have out outlined already, including uh, significantly high rates of vaccination in the adult population, across the state, as well as uh, mandated vaccinations and staff and the other layers of mitigation strategies we have in place to keep our schools safe. Are you able to give us any insight into what else will be announced in the first week of October and what, what other information will be provided? Uh, no, I'm not able to give, I'm not able to preempt uh, government decisions and announcements for the first week of October. Can you, given that schools are now likely to return weeks after pubs, gyms, hairdressers and nail salons reopen, have you considered bringing forward the return to school date? And so we picked a date in particular to allow our schools to plan uh, for the return across areas where they have been um, learning from home for an extended period. Uh, of course, we have we are seeing lots of um, dynamic returns to school and returns to learning from home around other parts of the state at the moment, and we respond to those as we need. But we continue to plan for the 25th. Uh, we chose that date uh, at the time with some view of vaccination rates and where that would lead to. Um, and wanted to make sure that we would, we would have those high vaccination rates in our communities so that our students who are unable to be vaccinated, uh, those under 12 in particular, would return to school in the safest environment possible. How many teachers are vaccinated as at today's date? Um, I can ask Ms. Katia to provide some uh, details of our understanding of staff vaccinations at this stage. Thanks, Yvette. Thank you, Secretary. Thanks for the question, Ms. Hussos. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Darig land today. Um, the answer, I suppose, in terms of a definitive number is, uh, is not going to be established until we are returning and we collect that information. However, as uh, the Secretary pointed out, we have insights through, through our survey. We've conducted that survey twice on the last occasion um, I mentioned the statistics there around that. Um, I can advise that um, the current vaccination status uh, of, as at the 17th of September, is that 79% of respondents had had at least one COVID-19 vaccination and 56% and of respondents had had two COVID-19 uh, vaccine doses. So, uh, 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 and we're pre predicting that that's going to continue uh, so the vast bulk of our workforce we're predicting will be fully vaccinated. And Ms. Huzos, if I could just add uh, to that answer, we surveyed on the first occasion and had 70,000 uh, approximately responses. And on this occasion, we had around 40 to 50,000 responses. So obviously uh, the, the representation of the sample will have changed over time as different, you know, different uh, members of our staff have chosen to respond to a voluntary survey. We will be working with schools from the start of next term to ensure they can start to get an insight into their own workforce planning, uh, to understand the local context and the local vaccination rates in their in their staff. Uh, but we are also then working on the kind of system level capture of that information so that we can store it and use it um, as we will need to moving forward. And what the, the November the eighth is the deadline to be double vaccinated? Is that correct? Um, Yvette, would you? Like details on it. Sorry, Secretary. Yes, under a proposed public health order, and again, this hasn't been published yet, my understanding is that that is the indicative date, the 8th of November. Okay, so what arrangements are in place for teachers who are not vaccinated by that deadline, Ms Harrison? 
Uh, so obviously we're working uh, closely with our staff, with our principals and with their representatives around how we uh, manage our staff leading up to that time. Our strong position here, as will be outlined in a public health order, is that our staff need to be vaccinated. Uh, for those who are um, unwilling to be vaccinated, uh, we will need to look at um, our ability to continue to support their employment in a school based setting. Uh, for those who are unable to because of medical exemptions, we will continue uh, to support them and ensure that uh, their, their safety is maintained by the level of vaccinated staff around them, uh, including by looking at um, alternative duties where appropriate. Um, and beyond that, we will be encouraging every staff member to, to get vaccinated uh, and be able to return uh, to work fully in the classroom with their students on the 25th of October and beyond. So will unvaccinated teachers continue to have their positions and continue to be paid after the 8th of November? Um, and so depending on unvaccinated the... by choice. Thank you. Uh, so, depending on the individual circumstances, and I think there are a variety of re reasons uh, why someone might choose not to be vaccinated, um, and so it will be on a case by case basis. We are certainly intending to take a um, reasonable and managed approach to our support of staff uh, where it is appropriate. They may be able to access leave provisions where it is not where that isn't available. Then we will need to look at. Um, other requirements. It will be a requirement of employment with us in the longer term uh, and once that public health order comes into effect and Ms. Katcher can provide some further information. Uh, Ms. Hussos, would you like me to provide any yeah, sure, further? Just briefly, that would be, yeah. Sure. So as the Secretary outlined, there are going to be numerous reasons why somebody may not be vaccinated by the 8th. That could include uh, any kind of issue relating to supply. So they may have an appointment for the 20th of November for their second vaccination. So as the secretary outlined, we're, we're going to be reasonable about this and look at those issues on a case by case basis. But as the secretary outlined, we have been informing our workforce for some time and it will be outlined in the public health order that okay, it is an thanks, expectation. I think, I think that's helpful. Enough. I'd thank like you, to move Mrs. on to a new area. Ms. Harrison, the Victorian Government has announced a $190 million package to improve ventilation and outdoor learning. How much is the New South Wales Government allocating for similar measures? You're on mute, Ms Harrison. Uh, my apologies. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, we note uh, the Victorian announcement yesterday for some very specific uh, and targeted uh, responses to some high risk areas in schools. Uh, we are undergoing our own evaluation of our requirements for ventilation. The advice remains that fresh air is the best form of ventilation and therefore uh, the, the primary source of ventilation will be through enabling fresh air to enter our classrooms through opening windows and doors. Uh, and Mr Manning can provide some uh, further details. But I, before I hand to Mr Manning, I would say we are more interested in ensuring the safety than looking at the amount of money that we are, we are spending. And so we are focused on making sure the environment is safe. And if that requires investment, we will, of course, be going and asking government for that, for, a, for the funding to support that investment. Mr. Uh, Anthony, Ms. Uh, sorry, before we go to Mr. Manning, Ms. Harrison, can you? You said you have advice. Is that advice from New South Wales Health? Uh, so we have advice and have been continuing to work with New South Wales Health. We are also uh, seeking our own independent advice around ventilation, and Mr. Manning can provide you with some further information. Yeah. Mr. Manning, thank you, Secretary. Um, for the Hansard Anthony Manning, School Infrastructure. Um, so the the. Uh, Progress is going well through the audit of our existing portfolio. Um, so as of today, we're about 50% through the portfolio. So more than 74,000 spaces have been inspected. Um, and that's more than 300,000 windows, very nearly 100,000 fans, um, and getting close to 9,000 extractor fans have been inspected as part of that process. Um, and we're we're now working through rectification of any of those that we found to be non non operational to ensure that they can be brought on stream as quickly as we possibly can, uh, and we'll continue to roll through the rest of the audit over the next uh, few days, um, so we can make sure all the rectification works are done. We have a complete uh, picture and assessment of uh, the natural ventilation processes that we can provide throughout schools. So when did that audit commence, Mr. Manning? So so we we started it. Uh, probably uh, two weeks ago, 
um, and got up to speed at least a week. Um, remember, we hold quite a lot of data in our system on schools, um, windows, our facilities management contractors are tasked with knowing a whole bunch of information, but we found in the past um, we really need to go out and resurvey for specific elements. And so this is the piece we've been doing now, getting back out, resurveying, resurveying revalidating the information that we've got to make sure that we've got a, a wholly accurate picture of, of the portfolio. So Mr Manning, the, the, the new survey, the new inspection, do you call it an audit? Is that correct? Yes, so that's the, that's so the, the audit. So the audit process began two weeks ago of classroom, is that correct? Yes, so yes, I think, I think okay. we're... And, and you've done 50% so far and you expect to do the, ne the remaining 50% in the next two weeks? Uh, I, we, we think we will have the survey finished before the end of next week. That's our target. By the end of next week? Yeah. Okay. And can you tell me what is the process of auditing classrooms? So we, we, whether it's a, a representative from our regional asset management office or whether it is a representative from our facilities management contractor, um, there is a visual inspection. Uh, and as part of that visual inspection, we look for uh, windows and the windows that open. We look for uh, internal fans and to make sure that they're functioning. And we're looking at extract fans as well. So trying to make sure that we've got a complete picture of both the natural and mechanical ventilation systems that we have, test to ensure that they're operational. And if they're not operational, we instruct through our facilities management contractor for them to be made operational uh, almost immediately. So that, as we roll through, we issue instructions for work to be carried out. So we're not waiting to get to the end of the audit to instruct the work. It's happening now and rolling through right now. And so you will be auditing every single classroom, is that correct? Our, our intent is to get into every single classroom. Whilst we hold um, data, um, we really need it to be visually inspected to be relied upon. And so Minister Mitchell has said that the review will ensure that all windows operate efficiently. What's the benchmark for operating efficiently? Well, uh, the, the vast majority of our windows are manual. Um, so we'll make sure that they, they operate easily and they, and they operate fully, open fully. They open fully, they need to be able to open fully to, to conform to your audit? Absolutely, yes, that's, that's our intent to make sure they can open, open fully so we get the maximum ventilation through that space. So we've been told that some windows only open 10 to 15%, would that be enough? It, again, it depends on the number of windows in a classroom. So as part of the analysis that we're doing, we'll be looking at the volume of openable windows in a classroom and that way we can work through a calculation of the fresh air ventilation that works its way through. So some, some windows have restrictors on them and don't open fully, but that's part of the calculations we're working our way through to ensure we can get the right ventilation into classrooms. So some experts, some architectural experts have said that you can't tell from just looking at a room. Are you doing any actual monitoring of CO2 levels? So we've, so we've, classrooms? yeah, it, it's, we hold, uh, our asset management systems are quite sophisticated. So we hold information on sizes of rooms, doors, and a whole range of other things. So we're able to, we're able to do those calculations. The visual inspection is about ensuring that those, those things are functioning. Um, where they're not functioning, we'll repair them. But we're, we're actually able to look at classroom sizes across the estate um, with the, the, the detailed plans that we hold across all our schools. And that's something that our asset management teams are updating on a regular basis so we understand exactly what a, a what a learning space looks like and how it's allocated because actually it forms part of the calculation of the capacity of the school and that then allows us to make some calculations around air flows um, and how they work to ensure that we're able to, to to be comfortable around the operation of those and so that yeah part of that is is then looking at the windows and how far they open and that gives us the openable area of window to understand the ventilation flow through yes but with respect mr manning didn't answer my question which is is there any use of electronic devices to monitor the current co2 levels within classrooms so as part, as part of, the, of your inspections as, as part of the audit no, there isn't. Um, okay. but so the, the, the audit but the is a visual inspection. It's a visual of inspection. How the classroom is functioning. It's a visual inspection and a calculation um, that until until the classroom has people in it, the CO two monitoring doesn't recognise the people in the room. Um, so we, you, you, know, you, you 
you, you need to do it through a calculation process rather than by monitoring at this stage. So, da, so going forward, will the monitoring include electronic monitoring of CO2 levels once students and staff return? So at the, at the moment, at the, we are working through the audit, we're working through the advice and the calculations, depending on the volume of air uh, and the openable windows, um, there will be more than enough air changes. And therefore, we, we, at the moment, there is no advice around needing to monitor that. Um, we will be comfortable around the number of air changes going through the room to be clear that it would clear the room. And that's the, that's the work that we're doing at the moment as part of that audit process. So just to be clear, there is no ongoing monitoring of what happens when students and staff return. Is that accurate? So at this stage of the audit, we're going through doing a check of what works and what doesn't work. We're getting advice in terms of the airflow. Um, and once we have that for audit and that full picture, we have that advice. We'll take it. We'll, we'll take the next steps as we need to. How many um, fans or exhaust fans were found to be broken as part of the audit? So, so far of the 93,000 fans inspected, uh, nearly 4,000 were found to not be working. And of the close to 9,000 extractor fans that have been inspected so far, um, a little over 1,100 have found to not be working. Sorry, it was 9,000 extractor fans and 1,100 weren't working? Yeah. Okay. And of the, um, how many of the classrooms have an air conditioning or a heating system installed? So we've, the, 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 sorry, the answer to the question depends on the, the systems that you're talking about. A lot of the systems that have been installed in schools funded through PNC and the like are actually recirculatory air systems. <clears throat> so they don't, they don't add any fresh air into the room. All they do is continue to recirculate the air that's within the room. The, the cooler classroom system that we have been rolling out, there are about 4,300 learning spaces that have been, um, uh, that the system has been installed into. As part of that system, we bring in, we automate uh, fresh air coming into classrooms as part of that process. The, but a lot of the schools where the split systems have been put in, um, they don't bring in external air. You would still need to open a window to bring fresh air in as part of that. And then the system would temper the air that's in the room. So, Mr Manning, how many of those classrooms have either a cooler classrooms installed uh, air conditioning or air conditioning that's been installed by PNC? So, so as I said, I think it's just a shade under 4,300 classrooms have been rolled out through the cooler classroom system. Um, and we, we, we don't hold accurate records on how many necessarily classrooms uh, the PNC have funded, quite often they happen without us acknowledging. Um, I, I can look into our asset management system. We might have to take that question on notice. Ms. Hughes, I'll, fine, I'm Mr. Sure we'll come back to this in, in a bit, but the opposition um, round has, the initial one has expired. <clears throat> um, Ms. Harrison, the, you would have seen yesterday's announcement from the Victorian government um, of $190 million to be spent on ventilation in Victorian schools. Did you see that announcement? Uh, we have seen that announcement, yes. Um, given Victoria um, has decided that ventilation is one of the three key pillars to getting schools back safely and are investing $190 million just on that pillar, can you advise us how much has been spent by the New South Wales government on ventilation? So I think, uh, as Ms. Huzos asked a similar question, Mr. Shoebridge, uh, we are more concerned about the safety in our classrooms as they are than we are the amount of money we might need to spend. If money is required uh, and if new investment is required, we will, of course, uh, take that into consideration. But our focus at the minute is ensuring that the natural ventilation, which we have been advised, is the most effective solution, uh, is accessible in as many of our learning spaces as possible. And where it isn't, we will have alternative solutions in place. Um, Mr. Manning, has some further detail on the Victorian announcement uh, and, our, and our consideration of it here in New South Wales and can provide some further information. Before we go to Mr Manning, and I assure you we will go there, <laughs> the reason Victoria has come up with this package now is because they have completed a detailed audit of their classrooms. They know what needs to be spent 
to keep the um, to keep the air circulating, um, and and they've completed their audit some weeks ago. Um, why is the New South Wales Department of Education only now in the middle of an audit, given Victoria was was miles ahead? Uh, and so I do not have uh, details on the Victorian audit or process that they have gone through, uh, and certainly. Um, have had no advice in relation to the work they may or may not have done in leading up to their announcement. Uh, Mr. Manning might have further information on that. We have been working closely with our uh, interstate partners uh, on, on these issues as they develop, and I'm sure Mr. Manning can provide you with some further information. Before we go there, Ms. Harrison, how can you have no knowledge about what Victoria is doing and be working at the same time closely with interstate jurisdictions? I, as so, don't, let me finish. Those two statements seem directly contradictory. Do you know with your close, you say you have a close um, working relationship with the Victorian officials, do you know when they completed their audit, for example? As I indicated, Mr. Shoebridge, uh, Mr. Manning can provide you with some further information on that. Mr. Manning. Thank you, Secretary. Um, so uh, we, we note um, Victoria's announcement uh, yesterday. I uh, also note that they are, they are also relying very heavily on natural ventilation into classrooms. Um, uh, the, my team have had conversations with their counterparts in Victoria, um, but I, I don't have any information about them sharing with us the extent of their audit or the fact they had that audit completed. Um, we were talking to them about uh, what options they were thinking of and looking at and sharing information in terms of we were in terms of strategy. Um, but. But, right. but I know that the Victorian commitment, again, relies very heavily on the use of natural ventilation within their schools, as, as is ours. Um, and as I've said before, the audit is well underway, well in progress, um, and, and will be completed very shortly, and we'll be able to act on that information as we have it. But we need to be sure that it's accurate and right. Mr Manning, how many air purification devices um, have been sourced by the Department of Education and are ready to be put in New South Wales school classrooms and common areas. How so many? As, as, as we've said before, we're working through the audit. We're, we're getting advice from the audit in terms of natural ventilation. Um, at that point, we'll be able to make decisions about mm -hmm. the specification of the systems we need to order um, and how many we will need to have. We have, we have been in dialogue with a number of suppliers of systems in readiness for, for a procurement process if we need to do one, given the, the, the time frames, And at this stage, we need to wait for the audits to be completed, wait for the airflow measurements to come through and be comfortable, and receive the, the advice we're looking for in terms of the specification of the units we need to order. Mr Manning, would a shorter answer to my question about how many um, have been sourced, would a shorter answer be zero? So as as I've said, we're waiting for the we're yeah, waiting yeah, for the results of the I audit. Asked for a number. I asked for a number, Mr. Manning, and I'm asking you if the answer is zero. As as at this point in time, well, we we are waiting for the audit to be completed. At which point we will be able to understand how many we need, and we'll Mr. go through Manning, that process at that point in time. Mr. Manning, I'm really going to ask you to answer my question. I'm going to ask you again: Is the answer zero? At as we're point, here today, is the answer zero? At this point in time. As I say, we, we have not placed any orders for any purification systems. The audits are underway. No, no, Mr. Once, Manning, Mr. Manning. I have, I have, answered, Manning, I have answered the question. question. I'm asking the number. If it's, I, if I have it's, told you, as, at this okay, point Mr. in time. Manning, please, please wait a second. I'm asking you the number. If the number's 100, tell us it's 100. If it's 51,000, tell us it's 51,000. But if it's naught, please tell us it's naught. What's in, the answer? In, my, in, in the last answer, uh, we, I, was, I confirmed we have as yet not ordered any purification mm -hmm. systems. We are pending the results of the audit, um, de defining the specification of the systems we will need. Mm -hmm. Should we need any, we will then get into the procurement process. And, as a, and in readiness for that, we have been talking to a number of suppliers to ensure that there are stocks available. And we'll continue to work our way through that. But until we have finished the audit, uh, until we have a clear specification of what we need to order, we, we will we will move on from that point forward. Mr. Manning, you only commenced the audit, Ms. Harrison. Mr. Manning, you only commenced the audit last week. Victoria is so far ahead that, that they haven't bought, they haven't sourced naught. They've sourced fifty one thousand air purifiers to go into their classrooms, and at the same point in time, even though we're further down the curve of of the of the pandemic, the New South Wales Department of Education has not ordered a single one. 
That That's seems to me like you've dropped the ball here. Ms. Harrison? Well, Mr. Shubridge, I, um, I can see the elements of your argument, but I don't accept them. It is important that we know what we need and what the specifications are of any air purifiers we would need. Uh, there are particular particle sizes uh, that are uh, they're required to be filtered in order for an air purification system to be beneficial. There is a particular uh, scale of air purification that would be required in particular classrooms if natural ventilation cannot be secured and be effective. Um, and we are not going to go and pre-order uh, um, solutions here that may not be effective in our settings. We are doing the thorough work. We are auditing every single learning space in the state. That is 156,000 spaces that we are auditing. Uh, we are, of course, using the school holiday period to minimise the disruption on our school's operations to make sure that we have got all the information, which is why we'll be accelerating the process through the it's school holiday. Harrison, there hasn't been anyone at a Sydney school for, for months and months and months. You haven't had to wait for school holidays. You could have had access to empty classrooms for months and months and months. The I, idea that you're waiting for the school holidays is plain nonsense, isn't it? I don't accept the premise of your question. We have had staff on across Greater Sydney and across uh, regional New South Wales. We have had people on school sites and we have wanted to minimise additional people going into school sites to keep those students who are attending school uh, as safe as possible. I'm not, well, you know, I think we've... We are undertaking the audit, as Mr Manning has made very clear, that audit will give us the uh, intelligence and information and evidence we need to ensure the solutions we provide for our schools work. I think it's really important for the committee and for our parents and communities in New South Wales to know we are putting mitigation strategies in place at all levels, a layered approach, starting with high levels of vaccines in the community, mandated vaccines Ms. in Ms. our Harrison, schools. Ms. Harrison, it's not an opportunity. Stop, stop. We have limited time. It's not an opportunity to, to go beyond the question that's been asked to you. We really have to keep it focused on answering the questions. Um, Ms. Harrison, you'd be aware that there are a mo many, many schools which are more than one story and have classrooms on seconds, second, third and higher stories. You'd be aware of that? Yes, Mr. Shoebridge. You'd also be aware of OHS requirements that mean that those windows in those classrooms can't open more than five or a maximum 10 centimetres because of OHS safety issues. And if you're not aware of that, I'm sure Mr Manning is. I am aware of that, Mr Shoebridge, and I think uh, we canvassed some of those issues in the questioning from Ms Huzos as well, so yes. Well, given, given that those windows can't be fully opened, um, how can you give any kind of commitment that you'll be able to get fresh air into, classroom, into classrooms where you can't open the windows more than five centimetres? But I, I just, th these are really practical issues that it's not me asking. It's parents asking, it's students asking. These are really practical issues and they want practical answers. Mr Manning, what's the answer? So part of the reason why we're doing the audit is so we can understand that there are mitigation strategies that we can put in place, in, in, including as, as we've got in some locations, um, um, mesh on windows so that actually you can open the window without there being a risk of falling. There are a number of mitigation measures we can work our way through. We need to complete the visual inspection so we can understand what we need to put into place to maximize the natural ventilation. And that's the work, that's the work that we are doing and we will continue to do. And once we have that picture, we'll, we will be able to move on that and implement what we need to do. Mr. Manning, when you drill down into it, it is so much more complicated than just simply opening windows, isn't it? It's so much more complicated than that. As I, as I said, once the audit is complete, we will have a complete picture of the, across the portfolio and we'll be able to implement the strategies that we need to. As I said, the, the, the advice universally is maximise the natural ventilation and that's the strategy that we're working our way through. Well, what about, what do you say to a parent who contacted me just this morning and said, my child's about to go back to a school in Penrith where it's likely to get to the mid forties um, um, in, in summer and the department's only answer is, to open up all the windows um, and destroy any kind of cool in that classroom. Um, how is that going to be a safe learning environment? That's a question a parent asked me just this morning. So what's uh, the answer to that? So Mr. Shoebridge, firstly, the answer is that ventilation is one only one part of our response here. Um, we cannot look at the layers of mitigation uh, around transmission in isolation of one another. They work together to minimise the transmission risk. In that classroom, uh, they will have a fully vaccinated teacher. 
in that classroom, uh, if it's a high school student, they will be wearing masks indoors, as will their teachers. In that classroom, the windows will be open as far as they are able, and we will have sourced uh, the appropriate solutions for that learning space. And so I would assure that that parent that we are doing everything that we can to ensure our schools are safe for the return of our students from the 25th of October. Well, in that classroom, if it has a a reverse cycle air conditioning system provided by the PNC at huge cost to the local community. Will there be a HEPA filter on that to filter the air and provide a level of additional safety? Will that be provided? So it will obviously depend on the specifics of that classroom. And uh, in order for the HEPA filters to be the appropriate HEPA filters and the appropriate air conditioning system, we will need to work through of those, which is why, as Mr Manning has said, I think repeatedly in answers to questions, uh, we are completing the audit. And once we have completed the audit, we will have the information about what is solution there a we're commitment? Looking for. Is there a commitment to install HEPA filters on all air conditioning systems to provide that additional that additional layer of safety? It's a pretty simple question. Is there that commitment right now? There is a commitment to ensure that our learning spaces have the appropriate levels of ventilation uh, that will assist as one of the strategies to minimise the, the transmission of COVID. You know that's not an answer to my question. So if you could answer my question. And if the answer is you can't say, tell us you can't say, but please don't try and just defer it like that. Well, Mr. Shubridge, I think the answer is important. We will ensure that there is the appropriate level of ventilation, which all of the experts tell us is the appropriate thing to do. And uh, if uh, you know, I understand the committee would like or potentially be looking for us to do more than that. But I think yes, it's Sarah, important. And all I'm asking for now is a very simple thing. I'm only asking for a very simple thing. Will you answer my question? It is there a commitment? No, let me let me put it to you again so it's unambiguous. Is there a commitment to put HEPA filters on all recycled air conditioning systems? Um, that are going to be that are going to be used in New South Wales public schools. Is there that very clear commitment? Because there is not one air conditioning system or unit in use in New South Wales public schools, I'm unable to give you a clear answer to that question. Our audit is underway. When our audit is complete, we will understand the circumstances in every classroom across the state in the 156,000 learning spaces that we have to ensure that they are safe. Could I ask you about? Um, ensuring that communal areas in schools are safe. Um, um, is the audit including communal areas? And is it going to, how are you going to test for the air circulation in communal areas, Mr. Manning? So the, so the audit is of all of our spaces, not just learning spaces. Um, and, and part of that will be looking at those communal spaces. As the, as the Secretary has said, there are a range of strategies, including um, staggering starts and finishing times in terms of use of those spaces and we'll be able to provide schools with advice about how those spaces can be used along with how we maximise the ventilation that's available to us in those spaces. Um, some of the advice that, that exists out there has been around um, purging air, so actually uh, leaving spaces open and available um, overnight so we can vent, we can vent spaces, leaving things on running for longer than school hours would normally be. So again, we can purge and all those things will be things we'll be looking at as part of our strategy once we've got the audit complete and we've got a complete picture of the of of the portfolio and the and the challenge. Will the audit be publicly available and will it be given promptly to critical stakeholders, including the Teachers Federation? I, I think we'll we've, we've got to wait till we get to the end of the audit. Um, but I, I, I see no reason why we wouldn't be we wouldn't be sharing that information with our stakeholders as part of our strategy to make sure that that schools are safe and people can understand so, that. So safe. do I get that as a commitment that will be promptly shared with the Teachers Federation? Uh, all of the all of the activities that we are doing are are in line with the direct requests of the Teachers Federation. So. Mm -hmm. The, Mr. Re the review, so, so to that's, to it. the saying, information will be, we, we are happy to share the information with our stakeholders so they can be comfortable that the spaces are, are safe. No, I appreciate that and I think it's a, a good commitment, Mr Manning, and I, I appreciate it. Um, Ms Harrison, how many current um, um, vacancies are there for teachers across New South Wales? I think the workforce is about 74,000. Last time I looked, there were at least 1,100 vacancies, is that right? 
Uh, so Ms. Catcher can provide you with some details on that. I would note that for the scale of our workforce, our vacancy rate is incredibly low. Uh, for an organization of our size, that is an exceptional, uh, an exceptional outcome and something that we continue. And it would be reasonable for us, obviously, to have vacancies due to a variety of reasons uh, across our workforce. But Ms. Catcher can give you the specific details. Thank you, Ms. Catcher. And, and, and um, I have also noticed the uh, recruitment ads where you've been trying to fill some of those gaps in the workforce. So Ms. Catcher. Could you tell us the, the numbers in the current workforce, the current vacancy, and how you're going filling the recruitment gap? Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Shoebridge. I'll have to take the number as at today on notice and provide that to the committee. But as the Secretary said, it is a very a, a reasonably small cohort given the size of our workforce. It's around between the high ones and 2%. Uh, you are quite right, Mr. Shoebridge, in saying that we we are undergoing an advertising campaign, as we always do in a department with a workforce of our size. We use a lot of different channels to advertise for various roles for both casual, temporary, and full time teachers. But is the it's about eleven hundred? Would that be the rough ballpark figure for the number of current vacancies? I, I can't attest right at this minute to that specific number, but it sounds roughly in the ballpark. Yes, Mr. Shoebridge. Yeah. Um, Ms. Catcher, have you had, with, with your sort of employment hat on, um, have you had an assessment of how many teachers will not be able to be at work and teaching, additional teachers, after the 8th of November? Because we are vaccinated? Sorry, Mr. Shoebridge, because they're unvaccinated. Correct. Because, well, there, there's, I guess, unpacking that question, there's a couple of reasons why a teacher would be unvaccinated. But going to your question. I'm just asking the ones who can't be in the, in the classroom, can't be teaching. I don't really care why they're not vaccinated, but can't be teaching because they're not vaccinated. Sure. At the moment, we, as we said earlier, there's been a vaccination survey and that's giving us our preliminary data. It won't be until schools go back to school that we collect that data. And obviously at the moment, individual um, principals, as uh, Murat Dizdar would attest, uh, are collecting, not collecting, but being told indicative, indicatively whether or not there are teachers who are concerned about meeting that timeline in terms of vaccination for a variety of reasons, whether it's a medical contraindication or whether it's a, uh, a, a firm choice not to get vaccinated regardless. Or it's, or it's the in inability to access the, the second dose, for example. Uh, if, if that is the case, when we get firm data, as we said earlier in a, in a previous question, we'll be assessing those on a case-by-case -case basis and we'll be taking, of course, a reasonable approach where there is an inability uh, to find access to a vaccination supply. But Ms. Katia, it would be an heroic achievement for the teaching um, profession if they got to anything like 90% double vaccination rates by the 8th of November, which means when school's returning, HSC's on, um, schools are full, there's going to be at least a 10% vacancy rate in teachers. Have you, how are you planning for that? How are you going to respond to that? Because that's going to happen really, really quickly and it's going to have a huge impact on schools across the state. How are you planning for this? We're planning for it by looking at the various workforce models that we always utilise when there is a, a gap in the workforce. As, as you can imagine, in a workforce of our size, we never fill every single role because every single day there are new vacancies being created in the system. Uh, the answer to your question the is... The 8th of November is not going to be like any single day. The 8th of November is going to be an extraordinary moment. Yes, it will, Mr Shoebridge. We understand that and we are, as I said, planning for that eventuality. We, we cannot suppose that it is 10%. Uh, we think that those teachers who are, have a medical contraindication will be low. Those teachers will be, will be working with them on a case-by-case -case basis to find alternative duties for them. Uh, we don't have firm numbers at this stage of the of those teachers who will evidence an indication not to receive a vaccination. There will be a, a cohort as well who, as you said before, will not be able to get supply. So it, it's very difficult to give you a firm number at this point because of the various uh, cohorts of, of individual staff members who are going to be required to be vaccinated by that date. 
well, I'm sure we'll come back to this, but on my short numbers, it's over 7,000 teachers. So the opposition. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to come back to the audits of classrooms. So Mr. Manning, just to confirm that your audits, your visual assessments of classrooms are not actually assessing whether there is a recirculating air conditioning unit that has been installed by the PNC. Is that correct? No, so as, as part of our inspection, we'll, we'll record We'll record those things as well. You are recording those, so yeah, you we will do. do we, 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 the, the system, the system records uh, a number, but we find that um, over time, schools have been adding to them themselves without engaging the asset management teams. And so, from time to time, we will find new ones added that we weren't aware of. And as we find them, we'll add them to our system so we can be sure we know they're there. So, we we should have a pretty complete picture. Um, and we'll sweep that up as part of the end of this audit process. So, Mr. Manning, perhaps then you can, and let me just get some figures here. So, you said you've done 70,000 classrooms, is that correct? So, we've done 70,000 spaces of, of 70, the more than 150,000 we need to do. So, okay. just shy of 50%. So, less than 50%. So, yeah, that's right. So, Ms. Harrison just said there's 156,000 that you're surveying. Yes, spaces. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And that number was as, as of, yesterday and, and we think we're, we're getting close to seven or eight percent a day in terms of volume of the portfolio that we're able to get out inspect and check okay so perhaps you can provide on notice for us of those seventy thousand classrooms that have been assessed how many of them have air conditioning units in them and you mean by air conditioning systems you mean recirculating air conditioning systems yes that's correct recirculating cooler classrooms any form of air conditioning sure yep we can we can interrogate our asset management system yep um ms harrison what's going to happen if the windows can't be opened what's going to happen if as is predicted bushfires are likely during spring or it's raining or there's a reason that the windows can't be opened what's the alternative plan uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Mr. Manning can provide further details on our plans around our assets. I think it's, in, you know, we're looking at the overall ventilation and the layers of mitigation that we have in place. Um, they, you know, I understand the committee's line of questioning here. Those layers of mitigation are up there with the world standards of uh, mitigation strategies across schools, some of the most stringent requirements placed in and around schools. Uh, for their return, uh, but Mr. Manning can provide some further information on your specific question. Well, Ms. Harrison, I might come to Mr. Manning in a moment, but you're saying that these are the best standards in terms of worldwide standards. Students in Victoria, students in the US, students in the UK will all have their air being filtered through HEPA air filters. These are things that are in high demand, and yet New South Wales has not ordered a single one yet. And so I indicated they were in line with world standards. In not all of those settings, are students required to wear masks, for example? In not all of those settings, are uh, teachers mandated to have vaccinations? So it is important that we look at the whole. But I uh, understand your question. Uh, I think Mr Manning has uh, covered this ground uh, substantially. We are completing an audit. If that audit shows we need additional additional support to, for ventilation in our classrooms, then we will uh, look into providing it. Of course we will. Um, our priority here is the safety of our staff and students. We are not looking to shortchange them. We are looking to do the thorough analysis to understand the situation in each of our spaces and to support that the local solutions to those local contexts. That's what we are attempting to do here. Um, and so um, Mr. Manning can provide some specifics around the kind of the weather and bushfires. Before we go to Mr. Manning, Ms. Harrison, you announced, you were part of the announcement five weeks ago that students would return to school. And yet it took three further weeks before you even started the assessment of how safe classrooms would be. What, have, what has your department been doing for this entire term to actually allow classrooms to be safe for our children to return? 
And so I, I don't accept the premise of the question in the development of the return to school plan. Uh, we continued and have continued. We worked with and have continued to work with New South Wales Health on the best advice available to us to ensure the safe return of our students. That is why we have the layers of mitigation in place that I've uh, laid out uh, for the committee. We have then, as uh, indications from around the world and other other states have indicated we have continued to look at other areas we can improve this situation uh, moving forward. And so Mr Manning has commenced the audit of our of our learning spaces and our other spaces in schools. We want to make sure we have the right information. We want to make sure we are uh, basing our decisions on the facts and on the situations in each of our schools. We have over 2,200 of them. They are all different. Uh, the learning spaces are of different sizes. Uh, as we have indicated, the, you know, depending on the number of floors, the windows are of different sizes, shapes and of opening variations. Uh, we have to account for all of those things. And so we are doing that thoroughly and consistently. And okay, we will Ms. Harrison, let's move to Mr. Manning and find out about what happens when there's bushfires or rain. Windows and doors can't be opened. So, thank you. So, as part of part of the audit, um, which we're doing, which is looking at kind of the extent of opening windows we have in classrooms and their, our ability to operate them, it includes mechanical ventilation within the school the school spaces as well. So, you'll be aware that a lot of classrooms have uh, at least one fan, maybe two fans on the ceiling as part of distributing the air. We'll also be getting an understanding of kind of where the opening windows are. Is in many cases, particularly in a, in a rain situation, we have got significant eaves. And so it, windows that are top opening can be left open without any of the rain coming into the building. Um, so we're, we're able to operate those. And quite often those windows are open anyway, even when it is raining, because that, that, that is how classrooms are ventilated and they'll continue to be ventilated that way. Well, Mr Manning, let me draw you to the crucial part of the question, which is in October and particularly in November and December, we don't usually expect to see a lot of rain, but it is likely, and the predictions are that that bushfires are more likely in spring. What is there going to be in place for classrooms if they are unable to open their windows because of the air quality outside? So that so that the if we look at the last bushfire season we had, and and most interaction we have with bushfire situations is actually. Um, back burning um, and our schools work very closely with the RFS around back, back burning uh, and wind direction and a whole range of others to make sure our schools are protected. Um, in the event of major bushfires, we obviously act very quickly. We work with RFS around locations of schools that are impacted either by a risk from the fire itself or the smoke. And, and in some cases, as we saw with the last bushfire season, um, there, were, there were days where we weren't able to operate schools because of the extent of the smoke. And, and so the, the, our schools are naturally ventilated and that's, that's how they've always worked. Um, and so that, that's an issue so regardless Manning, of that. Mr Manning, you are makes... not answering my question. If we see widespread bushfires and poor air quality, like we did at the end of 2019, right across the Sydney basin, what is going to happen to our schools if they are forced to close their windows and their doors? And so, Ms. Huzos, we will make a risk assessment of individual schools at that time in relation to the COVID risk and the bushfire risk, and we will make decisions about the way they are going to operate in that environment based on the advice at the time. That may include for some schools that we have to revert to learning from home for a short period of time. If that is what is required to keep our students safe, that's what we will do. Uh, it's what we do now if we have a, um, a confirmed case for COVID in a school. We move to learning from home briefly while we complete contact tracing and the like. We are going to be in a dynamic situation and an evolving situation. Uh, of course, we will monitor bushfire impacts and the requirements for ventilation and how those work Ms. together. Harrison, Ms. Harrison, Harrison, my time is limited. I'm going to stop you there. You are saying that if there are bushfires, our children will have to return to at home learning because at the moment you are not purchasing air filters. You are relying solely on opening windows. So if it as is likely happens in the Australian summer, there are bushfires and there is poor air quality, our students will have to return to learning at home. And, and so firstly, I'm not sure that's exactly uh, what I said, but I'm happy to clarify. 
If we require, in order to keep our students safe, due to a bushfire or a COVID outbreak or a combination of both, then we will, of course, revert to learning from home for the safety of our students in situations that requires it only. Uh, where we are working on ventilation is to complete the audit and then make sure that we have the suitable provisions in place to support our schools. So I, I can understand that you know, these two risks are running parallel for us. I think it's important that we are conscious about the way we are managing those risks, but we don't conflate uh, issues uh, unnecessarily uh, in relation to those two issues. This is not conflating issues, Ms. Harrison. This is predicting what is likely to happen in an Australian summer, particularly across Sydney. We have seen this happen frequently, even over the most recent years, and your planning for schools is simply that we will open windows. They are children are returning to schools during this peak bushfire season, and you have no other mitigation factors in place. And so I think, as we have said in previous answers, we are completing an audit of the ventilation requirements and needs in each of our spaces. Okay. Ms. Harrison, I'm going to move on. Can I just well, ask one I final think it's question? Really important. If we're going to be asked questions, Chair, it would be good if we could provide an answer. I understand members are short of time, but I've Ms. understood Harrison. what we're here Harrison. to answer questions. Harrison. Let, let me let me address this, Ms. Husos. Um, I think if Ms. Harrison has something fresh to add, um, and it appears to me that Ms. Harrison does have something fresh to add that hasn't been put on the record before, I'll give her that opportunity now. Ms. Harrison, something fresh? Uh, so, Mr. Schubert, it is to reconfirm the ventilation plan will be complete once the audit is complete, and I want to make sure the committee have a full understanding of that, that it is not simply open the windows, it is audit and understand the needs of each of our learning spaces and respond to those needs specifically. Ms. Harrison, okay. I, I don't think Ms. Harrison. What what is happening to classrooms that are designed for more than one class, where you have two classes within a learning space at the moment? And so, in a variety of those spaces, we have larger classrooms uh, where classrooms have been uh, combined, and we have joint teaching uh, in uh, in. In practice, occurring uh, those are large spaces. Many of them have dividing walls in space uh, in place. And Mr. Dizdar can give you some specific examples uh, in relation to combined classes uh, in our operational settings. Mira, Dizdar, I think my time's my time's going to run out. So perhaps Mr. Dizdar can provide that on notice. I just wanted to pass it to my colleague. Because, sorry, I haven't given her the opportunity right. to ask Ms. the question. Ms. Dizdar, uh, Ms. Dizdar, are you comfortable taking that on notice and providing? Details on notice. Sure, if uh, the committee wants that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Just dealing with mute. Um, I just have a question. It's probably to Mr. Manning. Um, what's the procure procurement timeline for air, air filtration or uh, air purifiers, given that um, uh, you're not going to have your audit completed for another week? So, so as I said in a. Uh, Previous answer: We we have been um, working with a number of suppliers. Um, uh, the procurement process could be pretty short once we are very clear on the specification we want. Um, and there are there are a range of suppliers that would have stocks that could well be suited to the specification we need. Um, I, I say I'm, I'm not going to preempt um, a procurement process, but it would be a short procurement process, and we believe there are stocks available, depending on the specification that we hand on. Uh, and we need to go through that procurement process to work our way through it. So I can't speculate on on how many are available and when they're available. But as I say, we've had numerous conversations with a range of suppliers um, and believe that there are stocks available to us. We've got to go through a procurement process first, but it will be a very short procurement process because effectively we can uh, we can be clear about the specification that we need to have delivered to us. And you don't believe there's going to be an issue in terms of supply? Given the numbers, 156,000. Obviously, not every classroom is going to have one, but the numbers could be significant, couldn't they? And that's why we've been in in discussion with a, a range of suppliers that we believe can can meet that obligation. So, that's, my my question though is, you are confident that once your audit is complete, um, that there will be sufficient um, stocks available to put in place safe classrooms in every classroom where necessary, according to you know, all of the criteria that you've outlined today, you're confident that we're not going to be back here in a month's time asking the same questions and you're saying, sorry, we can't get anything until March next year. So as, as, as the Secretary has already mentioned, we, we are working really hard to get to that point. 
um, and we, we endeavour to ensure that our schools are absolutely safe places and we'll continue to do that. And so we're confident that we have the measures in place that we need. So are you aware that the Victorians had to get their air purifiers from Korea? Are you looking at, when you say suppliers, they're not as all Australian based or are they international? Like what's no, there, are, there, are, there are a range of suppliers, both, both Australian based and international. Okay, thank you. Um, I've actually got a question. I think it's maybe to Mr Martin. It's about the HSC. Um, how many um, particular subject exams for the HSC have been cancelled altogether? Um, I'll, I think it's 11 uh, of the CACAFL exams, the community language exams, and that's because they're national exams and are held prior to the return to school date for the uh, safe return of the HSC on the 9th of November. But I'll get the exact number I noticed for you. And can you tell us which ones they are as well? I mean, I'm familiar that Tamil is one of them, but um, if you're saying there's 11, I I'll should provide you a full list on those. Are there any that aren't <clears throat> the um, community languages? Are there any others that are falling into this into this situation? No, it's it's precisely because um, the, the the timetable for the cacophilus, uh the community languages, is a national timetable. Um, that the students obviously have to sit the exams on the same day right around the country. Otherwise, you end up with issues of integrity. It's it's extremely unfortunate. But the health advice was for us not to begin the HSE till the ninth. Um, and we so can't. How, uh, how are those students going to be assessed for those subjects then? We will be uh, using the normal processes, which will be estimates and assessments based on the school work they've done so far, um, their school based assessment, et cetera. So we will have ways, uh, uh, our, our assessment committee will come up with um, uh, options that are both fair to the students and valid. Yep. Ms. Sharp, had you completed that run because your time has expired? Yep, no, that's fine. Um, Mr. Martin, while we have you, some water's passed under the bridge since I was last asking you questions about the HSC. Um, can you provide information to the committee about what measures will be undertaken to ensure that those students, especially in Western and Southwestern Sydney, who's had such a rough trot getting prepared for the HSC, what measures are gonna be put in place to ensure that they get a fair and equitable outcome in terms of scaling for the HSC? Thank you for your question, Mr. Shoebridge. Uh, the last time I was in front of the committee, I, I indicated that we had worked primarily on making sure the assessments, the school-based assessments were covered with uh, equitably. So the teachers marking their own students' assessment, the delay as long as possible for the return of marks and, and for the school-based assessment to occur. Uh, we were also at that point, uh, hadn't yet determined on the full range of exams, the suite of exams that were to be sat. And we now have, of course, 110 the full suite, except for the cacaphal exams I mentioned earlier. I'll just put the context in place that there are significantly different circumstances for students right across uh, New South Wales. Almost all students have had some levels, however slight, of uh, disruption to their um, face-to-face -face teaching. So the procedures and the processes we need to put in place need to be uh, fair enough for the individual students at particular lockdown areas, I think, where they've had really significant disadvantage, but maintain the equity um, uh, and the integrity of the exam process. So the COVID committee, which uh, uh, people are aware of, three sectors, two senior board members, will be looking at options uh, imminently for um, uh, providing an, a, a COVID special considerations approach for schools to apply for their students. It will need to be um, able to cover the large cohorts, but still have enough integrity that um, students are not uh, given um, more advantage in some areas than others. That will be provided to schools very early in term four before the HSC, so that they can put in applications both for individual students and for full cohorts. So is it intended that there'll be at least some options available for schools to put in applications on behalf of their entire year 12 cohort, say a school that's in Fairfield, um, that's, that knows that its entire year 12 cohort has been locked down in very intense lockdown um, with all of the difficulties that that entails, they'll be able to put an application in on behalf of their entire school population, the year 12 population, is that the intent? Uh, it is the case, though, even within those whole cohorts, that there are some students more significantly disadvantaged than others. So we need to be able to balance the full cohort application process with uh, individual and specific needs of individual st of students. But yes, we're not going to try and produce um, a, a series of documentation that would have schools filling out uh, enormous amounts of forms when, when the whole cohort has been disadvantaged. So 
so it's envisaged there'll be a school, a sort of year 12, um, schools will be able to make at least one application for their entire year 12 cohort, um, which will be based upon specific disadvantage based upon the, the lockdown experience that the school community has faced. Is that envisaged as part of the outcome? Without speculating on a, on a policy or a process that we haven't yet decided on, um, my assessment of it would be probably be that it'll be differentiated by subject rather than a full cohort because there are different disadvantages uh, faced by some students depending on the on the nature of the subject. But your overarching point is correct that we will be attempting to make sure that we deal with the integrity of the exam, the specific nature of individual disadvantage, but not create an enormous paperwork overload for teachers and principals. Well, also not putting it down to parents and the disadvantaged students themselves, ensuring no. that, that, that the work is going to be done because the most disadvantaged historically have had the least ability to access special disadvantage rules. Uh, there's some um, uh, misunderstanding there, Mr. Shoebridge. There are um, illness misadventure is largely um, I think equitably provided irrespective of advantage or disadvantage or SES. There are arguments that the, um, the process for students who have uh, particular dis uh, disabilities, et cetera, is disproportionately um, applied for. But in relation to illness misadventure, we will be making sure that the individual student's personal disadvantage does not get in the way of the application in the COVID environment in the lockdown at, at mm -hmm. LTAs. And it's envisaged that the, the applications will be made um, at a school level rather than re requiring the individual family or carers to be putting the applications in. Is, is yes. that how you envisage it? Um, Ms. Harrison, what additional supports are you going to be given, giving to teachers who are already dealing with so much to ensure that that process is actually going to be fair, that teachers are going to have the time that's needed to, um, to put the, the time into those applications so that year 12 students who have suffered the most actually get a fair shake. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shoebridge. And obviously uh, we will be providing guidance and support to our schools to complete the NESA processes. We await that final guidance uh, on what will be required, uh, but we will then be providing further support. And Mr. Dizdar can give uh, some further indication on the way that our schools will be approaching this task. You're at Dizdar Dizdar, if you can focus on what additional resources and support. Yeah. Um, Mr. Shoebridge, as Mr. Martin has outlined, once the procedures are clearly articulated to all of our schools, uh, we will make sure we connect with all of our principals. We've been doing it on a weekly basis in those lockdown LGAs. Uh, the collegiality and sharing of experience and expertise is really important. So the director of educational leadership, the executive director, will support our principals to unpack for their context how they might resource that. In some contexts, it might be taking a year advisor offline for a short period of time to assist with that process. It might be a deputy principal. It'll be important for us to share what that practice can look like so that we can support across schools. And we stand ready, Mr. Shoebridge, uh, with our director's educational leadership to support schools that may not have that expertise as well. Well, given we know that additional workload will inevitably come on, are there plans or afoot to, to bring in some casual teaching workforce to, to give that little surge of support that's needed? Because, you know, with the return to school, um, uh, with the HSC and all the other stresses, surely that additional support should be being planned now, Mr. Dizdar? Mr. Shoebridge, I think you raise a very good point. What I'd say about our casual workforce is they're really important to us and we've been encouraging principals, even in the COVID environment, to keep up their employment. And this is why I said connecting with everyone is going to be important. If a school needs to provide release for one of our experts, a year advisor deputy that I referenced, to be taken offline for a short period of time to assist with this process, then sure, we will support that school in its endeavours to do that. Um, uh, but, you know, what I also hear from Mr. Martin's answer is we're looking for a simplified process, recognising the context of those schools. I've been a secondary principal in the system, Mr. Shearbridge. I know uh, it's a really good question you ask. It can take some degree of documentation in a normal year, but this isn't a normal year. And Mr. Martin and Nessa are, are recognising that 
And so we're hopeful of a simplified process, but you're right, it may need support and we stand ready to support schools uh, that may not have that expertise, might not have casuals to draw on, and we'll be working in a group of schools to try and leverage uh, resources across schools as well. Um, Mr. Martin, if, if assuming we get to a point by the 8th of November, where at least initially, HSC students across the state can attend to um, to do exams. What are the arrangements going to be in place where there's a COVID outbreak or there's a public health um, a position adopted that say the students from one, two or 12 LGAs cannot safely attend um, to do exams? What, what's, what's, what's the practical way through on that? Thanks again for the question, Mr. Shoebridge. Um, we have had over the last uh, 20, 30 years, sorry, for NESA doing the HSE and before that, occasions where there have been whole cohorts unable to get to exam rooms, uh, bushfires, uh, floods. We had 22 bomb scares last November. Um, and some, in some cases, students could not return to an exam room or unable to go into an exam room. So there is a, a long established process it's generally for individual schools or for a, a particular you know, uh, emergency. Um, it would potentially be much wider applied this year if we need to, but we can do that. And then we, we use the normal processes of um, uh, looking at the school-based assessment to make estimates of where the students would have been on their HSC. Will that be comparing the cohort in other exams or will it be comparing, how will you manage, how will you be able to do a comparator between a school, potentially if you have a large number of schools um, that haven't been able to sit their exam, how will that comparator work? Uh, I, look, I, I couldn't possibly explain that myself. Um, we have a, a team of experts, but we also have, we use a technical advisory committee that are academic experts in assessment that come from uh, a number of the universities around New South Wales. They uh, provide us with advice on the integrity of our methodologies. Um, if we're talking about large cohorts, we would be looking primarily at the school-based assessment work, but as for moderators across other exams that may or may not have been sat, I couldn't go into detail now, but um, we would explain it, of course, when we got to the point. Mr Martin, if you can provide any further detail on either the equity measures relating to lockdown or those kind of pre-planned um, um, arrangements to deal with cohorts that can't sit the exam, um, if you could provide that on notice, that would be gratefully accepted. I happily do that, Mr. Shoebridge. If I may also, the questions asked by Ms. Sharp earlier, there are 18 collaborative curriculum and assessment framework for languages, CACAFL exams. Uh, they were set for the 19th of October um, nationally, and uh, there are 303 students impacted by the cancellation of those exams. So that were the, the questions I think that I said uh, I took on notice. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. Martin. Ms. Harrison. Um, can I ask you, what's public health, what's the public health advice you've got if you have, say, a high school with 1,500 students and maybe 200 teachers and support staff, um, they return to school and then a year nine student turns up and is, COVID, and is found to be COVID positive after a day at school. Um, is the entire school community going to be close contact, contacts and will they be required to um, quarantine for 14 days. Um, what's going to happen in practice in, in examples like that? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, and I'm conscious this is a this is an issue uh, on parents' minds at the moment. How will this be managed? How you know how much um, how much disruption might children face? We have been dealing with this um, in parts of the state uh, in the first outbreak of COVID in New South Wales, and then um, through this outbreak as well. We have a very um, well-trodden process that we understand and our schools know well. They're well supported by our Work Health and Safety Directorate. Uh, as in the community, we carry out contact tracing and as a department, we will be carrying out that con uh, contact tracing as we return to school to advise who is impacted and who is considered a close contact. Uh, it is one of the reasons why limiting the mixing of cohorts on school sites is so important to us as one of the measures that we are putting in place. Uh, it means that in those circumstances, the risk of transmission between cohorts is uh, is really minimised, and so we'll have the minimal disruption. Um, and Mr. Dizdar has been through uh, this process a number of times in the last term, and can give you uh, some insights into how that is managed locally. All right, but um, 
there's been at least 150 schools across the state that have been shut down for a fortnight after a COVID positive um, um, incident at the school uh, and with the deep cleaning required. I'm asking whether or not that's, that is what you expect to happen going forward. If a student or a teacher comes on and is, is COVID positive, can we expect the school to be shut down for 14 days for deep cleaning and everyone have to home quarantine? And so in very, in very few examples, would we have the whole school quarantining for two weeks? Um, that has occurred in um, uh, a small number of cases. Mr. Dizdar can give some further information on that. Uh, Mr. Shoebridge, uh, I can tell the committee that only on three occasions this year have we had schools that have had uh, a confirmed COVID case where we've had to switch to at-home learning for more than nine days. And, and that's been uh, cases where uh, there's been a, a determined large number of close contacts in that school, in one case, the entire school. But by far the vast majority, Mr. Shoebridge, have been only mm -hmm. non-operational for face-to-face -face teaching learning for one day. Uh, we've been able to do the close contact tracing, cleaning, communication, and then have uh, returned to face to face. But Mr. Dizda, the past is not necessarily a great indicator for the future because in most of those cases, you had a very, very small number of students and teachers at school. And that's why you haven't got the mixing issue. That's why you haven't got the large number of close contacts. I, so I understand. It's not necessarily a good indicator of what's going to happen after the 25th of October. Is I understand your question, and it's a it's a it's a fair question that you ask. Uh, the data that I gave you, though, is of on the Delta outbreak. It's not on the outbreak of last year. Um, and this goes to what Miss Harrison said as secretary. Uh, for our return to school plan, the school that you referenced, the fifteen hundred, seventeen hundred. I mean, it could be Westfield Sports High School. You know, large school. Let me just unpack what they're doing at that school. They already have different bell times, start, period alteration, recess, lunch, conclusion of day for different cohorts. We're encouraging cohorting. So year nine, you know, staying in their core curriculum areas of mass, English, science, moving together as a group into electives, having specific playground space uh, just for year nine. We need to do this and our school leaders are doing this to limit the to limit how many students may or staff become close contacts if there is a case, if there is a COVID case. And this is in this secondary context, don't forget, Mr. Shoebridge, uh, you know, doubly vaccinated adults, mask wearing for all of our uh, students as well. Uh, you know, we don't proclaim that's easy, but these are the measures that will help, help uh, if there is a case, limit the number of close contacts for that individual. All right. um, thank you for that detail, Mr. Dizda. Unfortunately, time has beaten us. Um, I'm sure there was a, a good many more issues that the opposition um, uh, would have liked to um, examine as, as would have, as would have uh, the crossbench. Can I thank you all for the work you do? Um, I know sometimes these um, questions are focus on, you know, the issues that we have. But I can assure you it's the concerted wish of the entire committee that the return to school is safe, that it's designed safely, that it's invested in safely, and that our kids and teachers and support staff can get back to school as safely and as promptly as possible. So we wish you, you, know, you have our collective good wishes in this space, but you also, I can assure you, will have our collective oversight going forward about what's happening. Um, so again, thank you very much for the work you're doing. Thank you, Ms. Shubridge. We welcome both the oversight um, and the sharing in of our in our objective here. Um, I know that many of uh, you on screen have been uh, managing learning from home yourselves during the last term and acknowledge how challenging that can be. Uh, and so I'm sure we will all be glad when our students can safely return to the classroom. All right. Thank you again. We will have a short recess and resume um, hearing at a quarter past three, where we'll be hearing from the Doherty Institute.
Good afternoon, uh, Professor McVernon. Good afternoon, how are you? I'm um, well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just uh, part of the secretary. I just wanted to make sure that you could hear us loud and clear. Yep, yep. all good. We can, we can hear you loud and clear. So um, I'll ask you just to pop yourself on mute um, until the chair uh, starts the session. Thank you. Sorry, Professor McVernon, can I just check you have the oath or affirmation handy as well? Yep, very Happy good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Professor McVernon. We'll just wait for 3.35 for the official start. Welcome back to our final session of the New South Wales Public Accountability Committee's um, COVID-19 Oversight Inquiry. We're very grateful that we could be joined this afternoon by uh, Professor McVernon, um, who's a director of the Doherty Institute. Um, Professor McVernon, um, if you could commence by giving the committee your name and your title, and then take either an oath or an affirmation, copies of which should have been provided to you by the Secretary. Thank you very much. Um, I am Professor Jody McVernon, and I'll correct you to say that I'm the Director of Epidemiology at the Doherty Institute and not its overall director. Um, and uh, the affirmation that I will read is that I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. 
Thank you. Thanks, Professor. And we're very happy to have you here in your capacity as uh, Director of Epidemiology, which seems to be squarely on point, um, given the issues we have at hand. Uh, the opportunity now is if you'd like to give a brief opening statement, um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I understand that the questions I'm being asked are around the relationship between the modelling we've conducted to inform the national plan and the New South Wales response. Uh, so in doing that, I'll just briefly um, cap on what is infectious diseases modelling. And basically, mathematicals are logical frameworks for thinking about consequences. Uh, they represent processes in a system that lead to observed outcomes. And they, in, in infectious disease models, look at the steps that lead from someone being susceptible to infected and infectious and recovered. So important things that influence that process and outcomes include how much people mix with each other, their ages, and whether they're vaccinated. And we can incorporate those into a model. Models can be used to analyze past or emerging data or to get, and that helps us get a better understanding of the key elements involved in those processes. But they're very useful in uncertain times to bring together emerging evidence to think through and project in time about what might happen. And so we separate out very clearly these scenario models that are logical thought exercises um, from those that are used in analysis or even in short-term forecasting. So that situational assessment monitoring is, is a different activity. In terms of our modeling for the national plan, our advice to national cabinet was that even high levels of completed vaccine coverage in Australia won't stop COVID in its tracks at 70 and 80%. Coverage thresholds, we show that um, we believe the vaccine will substantially reduce transmission of the virus uh, and do more of the heavy lifting of COVID control, but ongoing public health responses and low levels of social restrictions are still recommended uh, to keep disease low. And our report to National Cabinet on the 17th of September tested the robustness of our overall recommendations if COVID was already established in a community with tens or hundreds or thousands of daily infections at the time of reaching those transitions. And in the majority of cases, our conclusions weren't changed, but there was one important, important exception. And that was in transitioning to phase B at 70%, if there were thousands and we simulated a thousand to four and a half thousand infections in the community on that day, uh, there was a possibility of what we call overshoot. So epidemics grow, they have a certain momentum and even if the epidemic um, transmission potential we talk about is, is starting to reduce and the epidemic is going into decline from high case numbers, uh, the epidemic can still take a little while to stop growing. And in that situation, the epidemic um, that we simulated peaked earlier and was larger overall. And so our advice was in thinking about the balance of measures, a precautionary approach would be to maintain what in the model we termed medium restrictions as opposed to low until getting to the 80% threshold. Uh, in terms of relation to the roadmap, as we stated in our report, these are high level scenarios to inform strategy and translating them into action requires ongoing mapping to the situation, um, what's happening in terms of epidemic growth and clinical impacts, how the public health response is working, the existing level of restrictions and behaviours and local vaccine coverage. So the roadmap applies those principles about the synergies of control measures it takes a cautious staged approach to lifting restrictions from the 70% threshold. Uh, it refers clearly to the need for further fine tuning and health advice if circumstances change or if cases in a designated area remain too high. By providing greater freedoms first to only people who are fully vaccinated, it's even more cautious in that lifting of restrictions because vaccinated people are less likely to become infected. And if they do, they're less infectious to other people and obviously less at risk of severe outcomes and, and clinical consequence. Thank you. Um, thank you for that very neat summary, uh, Professor. I will hand over to the opposition to commence the first round of questions. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming along. Um, your information has been extremely helpful to this committee and obviously to all of our <coughs> state executives and state governments. Look, my questions really go to that 70 to 80 percent change and what does a medium sort of public health and social um, <clears throat> distancing measures mean because it seems to me and, and my reading of the new south wales roadmap is that really we're moving towards a lot of the lower phsms um, when it seems to me that your recommendations sort of suggest that there needs to be you know more of the stay more in the medium mode about you know where we are for a lot of places and I just wanted you to talk us through the, I suppose the, the issues that we should be aware of when we're thinking about that. 
Okay, thank you. So in the in the reports that we have, we have at the back a table of what we yep, call. That's what I'm looking at. That's exactly what I'm looking at. Yep. Yes, yep. exactly. Um, and it's really important to understand that those are not our recommendations. So these were periods of time, and actually, New South Wales is one of the few jurisdictions that implemented controls without full lockdown. So based on the experience of, of staged um, disease controls, we could actually estimate the impact of those measures on population behaviours and population movements. And we actually conduct weekly surveys looking at how people behave personally, how many contacts they make, and, and look at other mobility indicators. So under those levels of restrictions, at those times, they correlated with population behaviours that represented a level of disease control that we could estimate and then we could use those estimates in the models moving forward and so step them through. Now, obviously, every state and territory has had slightly different versions of those measures. And in fact, the thing that's important is, is what the population actually does. So um, in thinking about how those measures map to the future, again, it comes back to the situational monitoring. How do we actually see from what we call the transmission potential, which we report every week, that those measures are impacting on the population behaviour? So. Um, they're there as examples, they're there as sort of gradings, um, and in fact, we know that spontaneous population behaviours feed into those as well. They're not just, it's not all about the public health orders. Um, and, and those um, links from orders to observe transmission were also in a period where vaccination was not in play. So, you know, in thinking, well, how does that map to the future? I think we also have to make allowance for the fact that in allowing vaccinated people, greater social freedoms. We actually haven't measured that before, but we expect that those people would make less contribution to spread. So that's how I relate them in time. No, 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 that's right. And look, I, can I just say, I, I, I understood that there weren't recommendations. They were kind of trying to map between the two. I'm, I'm just, I am very interested though, that there's sort of, there just seems to be a lot of gray space. I assume that really what you're saying to us is that, you know, slow, slow, slow opening up with constant measurement um, is is the key, um, and and just being, I suppose the population recognising that people may have to go in and out of different restrictions depending on on how that operates. And the best guess at this point is we're not sure. We'll have to see how it goes. Is that a, a relative? Is that a reasonable? Yes. Description of that. So it's all about it's it, yeah. It's what we've had to do for the last eighteen months. It's about adaptation and monitoring and. You know, it's an adaptive, an adaptive management approach, which is really what we're what we're foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And look, the second part of this obviously is the ability to do contact tracing. Um, it, look, it, it's pretty clear in New South Wales that really we've been struggling for a while in relation to keeping up with contact tracing. Um, that's you know, the testing is still going well. Um, but can you can you just provide some thoughts on the importance of contact tracing, particularly in this opening up period? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, so um, we talk about partial and optimal TTIQ in the report. And sorry, you know, can you just spell it? T test, trace, isolate, sorry. quarantine. Yes, sorry. that's my hand side. Sorry. Yeah. Well embedded. Test, trace, isolate, quarantine. That's right. That public health response of case finding and contact ascertainment and and isolation and quarantine. So. Um, the optimal TTIQ response was actually based on New South Wales health performance over a period of four months, including the crossroads and Christmas New Year outbreaks. So, you know, that was a, that was an indicator of sustained high effectiveness. And in fact, um, again, we estimated the overall impact on spread. We also looked at the observed metrics about timeliness at that time, because timeliness is everything. And um, what we found the thing that's important to remember about COVID is that we know, and this was apparent early in the response, about half of the infectiousness of a case probably happens before they know they're infectious, before they're symptomatic. And that means that isolation as a measure has limited effectiveness. And we knew this at the beginning, that's why we said we're gonna need social measures. So that's obviously important how quickly you isolate people, test them and isolate them and, and get them away, but also how quickly you find their contacts and quarantine them. And in fact, most of the bang for your buck in TTIQ is from the quarantine part because it's getting people before they know they're infectious that's important. And we saw the overall reduction in TTIQ, due to TTIQ, was about 53% reduction overall in onward infection transmission at that best time. And then we took partial TTIQ from Victoria at the height of the second wave where other states and territories were helping. It was, it was a very stressed response. And it came down to about 40, 
it's 42, 43%. Don't quote me on the numbers, but it's in that ballpark, a 20% loss of effectiveness over demonstrably different processes. And I think that's quite important to reflect on because actually when we think about what we now do in contact tracing, you know, we know most transmission occurs in households. We see some transmission in work groups and workplaces and at social functions, which right now we don't have. Um, and, and those are reasonably identifiable. The kinds of contact tracing procedures that we've had in place over the past 18 months have been about zero tolerance and saying, all right, well, we could get to the majority of people with one or maybe two rings of contact tracing. But we're going to go all the way out to Bunnings and the supermarket, because if we miss even one, that has a consequence in an unimmunised population where we have to stamp out every last infection. So, you know, I think it's very important that in reflecting on how what we have escalated over the past 18 months in terms of contact tracing and what the demonstrated efficiency and effectiveness of every single one of those actions is, you know, most of the value will still be in the core activities in terms of trying to reduce transmission. So in that household circle, in those known close contacts in the workplace, for example. Um, so, you know, ongoing work is, is underway, um, you know, as part of our, our modelling for national the national plan and trying to understand what is actually happening on the ground with TTIQ. But, you know, I, I think what everyone understands and in thinking about what sustainable responses are going forward, um, that, you know, we, we don't need to do everything we used to do and we'll actually do things more efficiently and effectively by focusing closer on nearer to hand contacts, being able to get to them quickly and, and ensuring effectiveness that way. So it's, it's really a streamlining process in that condition. Great, thank you. Um, my final question before I hand over to my colleagues is, um, I just wanted, your reporting talks about Operation Shield and obviously the, the sort of return um, and the safe return of kids to school, something that um, every parent who's got a kid at home is desperate for. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, so I just wanna, could you just give us an update on, on where that's up to and where you think that's going? Um, from the modelling, from our modelling point of view, yeah. So um, what we are doing is helping to support um, the jurisdictions in their kind of risk appraisal of the, the types of levels of measures that um, are most effective um, at helping children to resume and stay in face-to-face -face education safely. Um, we are thinking about in the context of surrounding community levels of vaccination and infection transmission um, and, uh, and really putting up the kind of um, operational response questions about, you know, what, what is the lowest level of risk in the first instance? And then, you know, what's your, what's your best strategy around things like contact tracing or other things? And, and at what point would you say a school might need to close? But it's really helping people work through that in a kind of risk quantification way based on strategies that are being considered and have been implemented elsewhere and where there's some quantitative evidence for their effectiveness. So that's all ongoing. And obviously, you know, since our first phase work was done, we have 12 to 15 year old immunisation. We have, you know, high uptake, particularly in those higher years of education where face to face is critical. Um, and so we can think through scenarios about how that does change the risk environment, you know, for children and teachers to be immunised, but most importantly for their families and communities to be immunised, because as we said in our first work, immunising parents is actually key. Um, if you look at the UK example, it's the community risk that influences the importations into schools, and, and that really is, is where that, that focus in the first place was, was targeted. Terrific, thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much, um, Professor. McVernon um, for your time today, but especially for the very important work that, um, that you're doing uh, to inform our way out. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically on the return to school um, model. Have you done any specific modelling on how many cases you think there should be within the community before it should prompt a, a return to um, at-home learning? There is a, and, and I, I give you some context, our, our previous session today was actually with the Department of Education. And one of the questions we obviously have is that children will be returning to school just as we are starting to open up. In fact, several weeks after we start to open up, it's likely that we may see a spike in cases within the community. Do you or have you done modelling on what would be the tipping point that would mean that they wouldn't be able to return to school? So our first phase of deliverables are next week. 
Um, and in that we have a scenario based approach. So it would basically be saying for a community of this type with this level of courage and, you know, we have a, a strong equity focus here. So we're actually very interested in representing key features, say, of small areas where there may be, you know, increased call communities, larger household size, other factors that would be associated with increased risk of transmission in homes and, you know, potentially varying levels of coverage. So really thinking about um, what the implications might be in different types of communities where there can be different levels of control. Um, and, and I think then our focus is really, well, what would be the redoubled efforts in schools, particularly given the educational risks of those children of not being able to resume face-to-face -face learning, you know, particularly if distance learning and other things are limited. So that's kind of the motivating equity question when we've transitioned our work to the implementation level. Um, so yes, so there's a, you know, what is the risk of importation into the school? How do you then reduce the consequences of that in terms of spreading that environment, but also maximising as much as possible opportunities for children to still attend education. You know, there are many other strategies that have been used internationally and that's it's a way we can just interrogate that. And, and that may mean that there are more focused responses and additional resources applied to those higher risk areas than to areas with very little transmission. And I think that's when, when keeping schools open is the goal, then it's about well, what other things do you need to put in place in particular settings? So how important is ventilation in that in that equation? So I know this is a very fraught issue. Um, we have spoken extensively with airflow engineers. I'm actually part of projects for the city of Melbourne and at the University of Melbourne looking at these issues in other educational environments. And um, I know different jurisdictions are taking different positions on this. My personal view, based on my understanding of the evidence, speaking to the experts that I work with, um, is that, um, you know, Clearly, airborne transmission is one route by which COVID-19 can spread. Being in very low airflow environments does increase the risk that it might spread. Um, you know, there are demonstrable um, measures that can increase air exchanges to a very high level, and there's a quantifiable way of how many airflow exchanges you need to reduce risk. You know, if you're in a negative pressure room in a hospital, um, you know, in an isolation room, that risk is extremely low. But you know, the interventions needed to get to that very low level are quite substantial. Um, and that in a school environment where children are not sitting individually in hospital beds or cubicles, there are many other close contact opportunities for infection spread. So how important that single modality is to infection transmission is I think highly debatable in the educational environment. And I have teenagers and I've heard their reports of social distancing in the school environment, you know, whatever, whatever the best, the best, um, the best measures are. So, you know, I think we see that we we can model in a way that we feel is quantifiable, things like cohorting of classes, yeah, reducing mixing group sizes is something you can definitely calculate what's the consequence for infection and outbreaks, looking at vaccination coverage in teachers and students, looking at many of these other things, I think these structural modifications, um, we feel confident we can quantify. We have an approach to saying, well, if there are other measures in the environment that can be modified to reduce transmission by a proportion, this is what their additional impact might be. So then are we confident that the measures would reduce transmission by that much? So it's really putting the weighting back on the evidence for that reduction um, to say, well, does that justify the addition of a particular intervention? That's the approach we've chosen based on our appraisal of how quantifiable the evidence is. Yeah, and, and obviously these are very dynamic environments, particularly with small children. You know, I have small children, so I'm <laughs> with the, the difficulties and the idea of social distancing or mask wearing in a kim or a year one class seems a little uh, difficult to me. So that's why, you know, we obviously need to be aware of then those other factors that are, that are layering on top. Yeah, that's right. So that's why for us, the, you know, are children likely to arrive at school infected? Are teachers likely to arrive at school infected? You know, what are the, the, the opportunities there, particularly between adults that might amplify risks in the school environment? I think we see as things we can also weigh up. We're not explicitly modeling early childhood environments to be clear. Um, and also just to be clear, the objective of our work is, is really focused on the influence of the community on transmission risks in schools, not how schools contribute to risks in the community because Everything we see tells us, you know, it, it's more of an inward flow. Yeah, that, that initial round um, has expired from the opposition. We'll come back uh, and I'll hand over now to Ms. Fairman. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to go first to the virulence of the Delta strain. And I note reports um, in the media this week about the international experience of Delta, and that is that a person is almost twice as likely as someone with the Alpha variant to be hospitalised. But I understand that Doherty's modelling hasn't factored the virulence of um, Delta into its modelling. What impact does that have, do you think, um, on the, well, firstly, on your modelling potentially, and what impact it could have on the 70% reduced restrictions that New South Wales is, um, is pursuing? Sure. So to be clear, our modelling very much thinks about Delta. These models were first configured in July and based on the evidence then. So in terms of transmissibility and infectiousness and vaccine effectiveness, those parameters really haven't shifted. So most of our work is really focused on how we control spread. In terms of thinking about consequences, yes, at that time it was, you know, maybe the same as alpha, maybe better, maybe worse. We agree now it's worse and our future modelling will take that forward. Um, but really our, our overall strategy was one of minimising case numbers, and that was a combined recommendation with Treasury by aiming to achieve control through the synergy of interventions. So our recommendation to keep case numbers as low as possible holds. Um, and we don't think it's actually substantively changed by that. Now, some people see scenarios that produce tables of relative outcomes as predictions. So in that situation, you would need to increase those numbers, but those numbers are really there to compare outcomes to give you a strategy. So in terms of actually mapping what that meant and in thinking about health system consequences, it again brings you back to the situational assessment, which says, okay, we've now updated our understanding of severity if our objective locally is to keep things within health system capacity, then we need to see how current infections are tracking to our estimates of, of local burden. So that's the mapping of the strategy to the present. Okay, so I just wanted to, so the, with the second, the second dose, it takes two to three weeks, doesn't it, after that second dose for it to, for that double dose to really be um, as effective as it, uh, yes? So Delta, so, Doherty's modelling when you're talking about 70% and 80% double dose, do you factor that in? Yeah. So we, we made that clear. We have, were asked that question by NatCab and in our last report, we, we made that point clearly that we are talking about introduction at the threshold, which is when the, re the immunisation register says we get there and model is a dynamic model and there are individuals in the model who are immunised and two weeks after they're immunised, that full effectiveness kicks in. So yes, that's all made allowance for. So, in other words, when the government is, you know, there's a, this kind of date, if you like, that we're tracking to to have 70% double dosed, really, it's two to three weeks after what we're tracking, because I think people are talking at the moment about potentially 10th or 11th of October, if you like, but that's the day that we tick over just mm -hmm. in terms of a number, 70%, yep. but we don't not, tick over in terms, that's, we're more like 60% double dose, is that right? No, no, no. So... What we've modelled, so when governments are talking about we want to get to 70% doses administered, ticked off in the book in the register, that's exactly the point at which we made our transitions. So within the model, the people who were immunised in their second dose, the, well, you know, the ones who were immunised within the last two weeks, right, would take another two weeks to build up to full immunity. We actually worked out that at the kind of 17, 80% thresholds, that was maybe 12% of people. Gotcha. So okay, so you're... We've, we've accounted for that. We also, in our model, because by the time you get to 80% of people or 70% of people with two doses, there's another about 10 or 12% who've had a single dose. And those people are also contributing to the control of infection in the community. So they're also accounted for in the simulations. Okay, okay. all right. That's Thank you. That's um, That's actually a very good clarification. I just wanted to, um, when you, Doherty's findings around relaxing restrictions at 70% double dose as well are, and I quote from the report, conditional on public health workforce and response capacity, which varies nationally. Mm -hmm. So what are your observations around the capacity of the New South Wales health workforce, particularly when it comes to what the New South Wales government is proposing to do at 70%, and that is to release, um, relax you know, restrictions around pubs and clubs, for example, reopening. Do you think our public workforce is, is, is one of those states that can cope with that? 
So again, um, this is around the control objective. So in thinking about that workforce and response capacity, it's back to what's your TTIQ looking like? So what's that case finding looking like and how is that controlling disease? And by keeping numbers static or lowering them, you know, and we, we are already seeing in parts of New South Wales, the turnover in some areas because of the high immunisation uptake, we would anticipate that as vaccine does more heavy lifting, that that will happen in more areas. You know, it's, it's for that system to understand its capacity for response. Um, but by acknowledging that vaccination is doing more of the holding and therefore you can ease, you know, you're really trying to achieve a level steady state essentially, or bring cases down over time. Could you, could you just expand upon why then though you did it was uh, particularly noted in the executive summary of the Doherty modelling report that the 70% reopening was conditional on the public health workforce um, being able to cope? Because of course, you would be very well aware of the situation with our public hospitals, the situation with our ambulances. I think um, on average, the last week was 59 minutes or something for, for, um, for some calls. Like, it's quite extraordinary already. We haven't hit the peak. So why did Doherty put in its report that opening up or releasing, sorry, re, 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 um, relaxing some public health measures at 70% was conditional on that? So it's public health workforce as it relates to TTIQ system performance, because we say, here's what your public health response is achieving. Here's what your social measures are achieving. Here's what vaccination is achieving for you. So it's all about that triangulation. And obviously health sector capacity is another issue and jurisdictions will have to titrate within that as well, based on their situational assessment. So okay, because I mean even if we we capacity it, right? is, is there. Yeah. I mean, we're recognizing, for instance, you know, Tasmania and South Australia have a much smaller public health workforce and response capacity than New South Wales. For example. Yes, but our, our TTIQ capacity, when you consider some stories that have come out recently of people, um, you know, being at home for, for 30 or 40 days after um, testing positive and being unable to have a New South Wales health person return their call would suggest that our that particular aspect of the workforce isn't able to cope at the moment. So that's for the part of the local assessment. Um, to be made, and as I say, it comes down to what is the sort of demonstrable effectiveness. When in the situational assessments that we do, just to be clear, it's every week um, an overlapping team of researchers to so those who've produced this report uh, report weekly to the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. I don't know if you're aware of our regular work, and that is used by the CHOs, and that work talks about transmission potential. So it is this idea of how is the community behaving, and how likely is it for infections to spread. We also look at the effective reproduction number from currently active cases. And that metric says how well is the health response holding spread from current cases. And that's a factor both of the timeliness of responses, but also often where the infection is spreading. So for example, in Victoria in the in the second wave outbreak, you know, we had outbreaks in hospitals and aged care facilities where the infection was spreading in larger numbers. In some states and territories, there are challenges in covert networks where the infection is spreading and has opportunity to spread. So both of those metrics give us some idea of what is happening. And also we look to estimate, you know, how the, how the, the response is holding cases. So those two things are both separate indicators. Um, th thanks very much, Professor, um, for your very detailed answers. And, and already, I think we're getting some additional clarification on your report. Um, your, your, your 17 September addendum report, Ms. Fairman was asking you about your assumptions about the infective the, the infection rate of del of the Delta uh, mm -hmm. virus, and you hadn't changed the assumptions as at 17 September to, to what had been in your earlier report. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So we we felt confident that the severity outcomes. Um, there were sort of some seminal publications only about two three weeks ago. I'm sorry, time concertina's in my head, and we've been consulting with health to be sure that that's the most robust. Yeah, we've updated that for the next tranche of work. But for a model that was developed in July, we we were asked to look at a specific seeding assumption around control. So we didn't update that piece for that. Yeah. No, Professor, none of this is intended in the slightest as a criticism. <laughs> no, that no, you're able really clear, yeah. to respond in, in real time to the to the um, to that information that's coming from international studies, I think is a genuine credit to you. Um, but I, I suppose my question is, 
when we look at the numbers in that 17 September report on ward admissions and ICU admissions, mm. are they the numbers that you would expect to, to increase, all other things being equal, Yes. when you took into account the, the, the greater severity of Delta? Yes, so it's those clinical outcomes that would be different. Um, and that would be, yeah, we, we also report them by age categories and we, re and we report them by vaccination status and we report them there. And really, for the purpose of that exercise, it's saying, well, what are the most influential things to reduce those? So we start with, you know, baseline social measures, which is basically everybody pretty free range and, you know, partial TTIQ because we say, well, okay, at high numbers, it's not going to be feasible to do the best. Um, but then by increasing, you know, low level measures or medium level measures and other things, you show that you can actually then reduce those outcomes further. Now, now Professor, I'm going to apologise now for being a, an MP and not an epidemiologist and, and put this to you. If the in, infection rate of Delta is roughly twice what your initial assumptions were, um, um, does that produce anything like twice the numbers? Sorry, I'll start again. If the if the severity of outcomes of Delta is something like twice what the initial assumptions were, does that produce something like twice the numbers of ward admissions and ICU admissions? And and if not, can you talk us through that? Yeah. So I've actually it, it's not as simple a question as you're asking, so it's not a silly question at all. In the unvaccinated group, I would say yes, you could probably double them, you know, in the age cohorts. Um, in the vaccinated group, though, it is more complicated because the vaccine progression from just getting infected to then developing symptoms. And then if you have symptoms, what's the probability of going to a hospital bed? And from there, what's the probability of ICU? I actually don't know, honestly, in my mind, whether those would just automatically double because, you know, there's this sort of stepwise progression of vaccine effects that we observe. So I would have to take that on notice. And you know, obviously in our future work, we're actually doing some work at the moment on clinical outcomes um, for just these scenarios with the updated parameters at the level of all of the states and territories, which is actually a much more meaningful level to start thinking about this because you know Australia is not gonna have a single national COVID epidemic. No, indeed. Well, so that's like, you know, that's deliberately a, yeah, it's yeah. deliberately a high level abstraction as a thought experiment. And in, and in moving forward, you know, as I say, we are doing additional work for the Commonwealth with the new parameters at a level that we believe translates more to a, a real clinical capacity question. And obviously, New South Wales has had Burnett and others modelling, and they've used slightly different assumptions, and same in Victoria. And, you know, our models come up with the same broadly sensible conclusions. The actual scenario projections on cases will differ depending on exactly the assumptions that are used. And in reality, you know, in mon monitoring the situation, sometimes I think overall things have been better in some cases than anticipated, but you know it also then depends what the communities are who are affected by virus and whether they have greater underlying risk factors and health determinants and and so on. And so this is where all our next phase of work is really thinking more about these local population effects and how important they are. I will come to that in, in just one second. But in, if if policymakers are looking at your initial two reports and looking at policy settings that take us close to the threshold or maybe slightly beyond the threshold of our capacity in the health system, particularly ICUs, then there should be a degree of caution um, used by policymakers in relying upon those numbers, given the developing state of the evidence in terms of the severity of Delta. Would that be fair? Take away. So, so we, we would say in taking the high level principles, they need to be mapping to what is happening in front of them. Um, could I ask you about, uh, in terms of, if, if we're making statewide policy decisions um, in circumstances where we're likely to have pockets, perhaps entire regions, with significantly lower vaccination rates and communities like First Nations communities, especially vulnerable, how does that feature in your modelling? And, and is that maybe what you're working on over the next few weeks? Yeah. So, so you know, again, we, we emphasize we were actually very disappointed that we had to keep doing sensitivity analyses on the first model because we are undertaking this additional body of work. And, you know, in that um, situation, we are looking at, I mean, obviously, um, there's been a strong focus of, of all um, public health units and health responders to really look and seek to improve coverage as much as possible in 
populations who are deemed at higher risk because of underlying determinants. Um, what we are doing is helping to think that through in terms of um, whether we should actually have higher aspirational targets in some groups to achieve greater equity of health outcomes. Uh, but if that can't be achieved um, for whatever reason, and obviously removing barriers and improving access is key, but in some communities there is still hesitancy, then what we're saying is, well, then in this titration of you have your TTIQ response and you have other public health and social measures, you know, how should that be interpreted at the local responder level? And really in thinking about what does TTIQ moving forward, you, know, you would probably concentrate more of those resources in areas with lower coverage or at higher risk. And in that, we're also thinking about reactive immunisation. And we've seen that used very effectively in New South Wales, you know, in local <laughs> government areas and, and how that's helped. And, and probably ongoing travel restrictions into regional parts of New South Wales that have lower vaccination rates would be one of the ongoing control measures. Would that be right? So, you know, the national plan allows for locally and generally applied measures as needed for disease control, but that would be up to the jurisdictions to determine how best to manage that risk. Uh, and I know, you know, many jurisdictions are considering those kind of place-based restrictions, um, lock-ins and all sorts of things um, in, in remote communities and so on. Um, but that's something that's completely within the jurisdiction's ability to use as a, con as a, as a control measure. Thanks, Professor. I'll pass back to the opposition now. Thanks very much, um, Chair. I've just got a couple of final questions, and I think our time's fast running out, unfortunately. Um, can I just ask you, Professor McVernon, um, you talk about partial TTIQ and optimal TTIQ. I think we all acknowledge at the moment. Well, no, can I ask you, where where would New South Wales be fitting at the moment in terms of its contact tracing? Yeah, so, I mean, clearly it's not optimal. We can all answer that. In terms of how close is it to what that partial TTIQ in Victoria at the heart of the second wave achieved, <laughs> um, those analyses are ongoing, looking at data that's that's currently in the response, but I actually don't have the answers to that. Those analyses aren't finished. Um, our modelling team is working closely with uh, CDNA, Communicable Disease Network of Australia, and the public health units, and also AHPPC to think strategically about these responses moving forward. And a large part of that, of working out what are actually the key components of an effective response, is, is being determined by learning from what's happening in New South Wales and Victoria right now and measuring that. But the, the answers aren't back on that. And I guess then, if you can answer this, can we get back to the optimal or what would we need to get back to the optimal if we because that's yeah. obviously a crucial part of, of your plan yeah so i mean op optimal if you can do it is clearly is clearly great and i think a lot of the smaller jurisdictions without COVID are aiming to keep that going for as long as possible and i think everybody appreciates that um you know there'll be sort of gradations of working out you know at what point you start to to set things back and you know we Things like a four hour case interview becomes a one hour case interview. There are lots of ways to improve efficiencies in the system. I think the important thing is, is really determining what are the key metrics that mean the system is starting to struggle. And we know the one that means it won't work is that time to isolation of the index case. Once that starts to slide, then you kind of lose everything after. And so there are even specific things about if you get to this many days you know, and you haven't got to a case, who do you put in the queue next? It's it's actually a really, um, it's a queuing problem. It's an efficiency issue. It's thinking about where you're going to get maximum gain. And we've showed early on that, you know, one of the problems we had very early in some of the responses um, back last year was, you know, over testing of the worried well for no indication, for example, puts enormous strain on the testing system and leads to system wide delays that mean that the people who need to be tested don't get tested. So this, this whole idea of, of efficiency, of, of optimising, of restricting your focus and improving the timeliness is more important than just keeping doing more. You have to think about the value of responding, the value of testing and optimising that value to be sure that you achieve the response objective, which is not just more of everything, it's actually limiting spread. So we've done a lot of this kind of strategic work with um, AHPPC and the Public Health Laboratory Network over the past year about thinking of the value of doing things. And that really, that same approach that we had to the value of testing is really, I guess, what's happening with TTIQ right now. What's the value of different response actions so that you can really prioritise? And sorry, that will be available next week, is that right? 
Um, so we are already on very punishing timelines. So we have okay. a really deliverable to National Cabinet next week. Um, we're doing this work in parallel with health and we both have reporting deliverables um, which will you know, be linked but represent their work as well as our work, which you know, they've proposed strategies. We use models that then help people do the quantitative risk assessment around proposals and that goes back into their thinking. So, you know, we'll have developed our models further in response to that and they'll have come to their conclusions. Um, but that's that's due to National Cabinet on the 15th of October. Sorry, I'm not trying to impose yeah. great. No, no, I'm just explaining. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I, I'm just giving you the complete answer to, to when, when we're reporting. We're already um, looking forward to all of that. <laughs> Yeah. I think I might have time for one final question, yeah. which is yeah. then how useful is then um, more informal notifications like we have seen in the past and still in regional areas, you know, the notification of shops or retail centres or um, that, that have had a positive case. In Sydney, that's, that's dropped off now. Yeah. How useful is that in terms of your um, optimal TTIQ? I mean, that, that's exactly the sort of question that we're interrogating. So, um, you know, at, at, at low case numbers and with a zero COVID strategy, those kind of things were really important because you couldn't afford to miss one, you know, and we, we have examples, rare examples. I mean, the, the, the BWS in Barella around Christmas where, you know, three bottle shop workers got infected and thousands of people are in and out. You know, that's, that's a disaster waiting to happen. But actually those sorts of transmission events in supermarkets are vanishingly rare and are not regularly repeated. So, um, so it's exactly trying to, to work out um, how, how often they're needed, because you also get to a tipping point where it's not only all the public health response effort that's going into those things, but, you know, in some regional towns like Shepparton, when a third of the population was in quarantine, nobody could actually get supermarket deliveries and even McDonald's was closed at six o'clock. So, you know, the sort of societal impacts of, of over measures when that is no longer your objective, you know, that, that's exactly the tipping point that people are looking to find now. Ms. Yusos, we're going to pass across to Ms. Kate Fairman for the final session. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about the modelling in relation to the death rate. So here in New South Wales, we have a, I'm sure you've seen where our hospitals will go into potentially code red and code black. And part of that's severe and overwhelmed. And as a result of being severe and overwhelmed, the nurse to patient ratio suffers. Um, mm -hmm. There's an alternative workforce that um, uh, is called team nursing. So in other words, there's not enough nurses per patient. How is that in terms of reduced care factored in? And I'll throw, because of time, I'll also throw this in as well. We've had people die at home with our hospital at home program. So is that also factored into the modelling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so this kind of system stress issue is really difficult. And actually early in the pandemic, we were very wary of taking any kind of case fatality estimates from New York or Italy or other places where the health system was clearly overstressed and there was prioritisation um, of resource access. Um, and extrapolating that. I think over time, as things have got more steady, the kind of estimates of death rates we're using now are based on very busy systems, but ones that kind of have been optimised for high case loads, but not completely overwhelmed. And I think in terms of understanding the Australian environment, it's actually been very hard to learn from the Australian experience because given our low case threshold, um, our hospitalisation rates are far above other countries, but that's because some jurisdictions hospitalise everybody It's COVID. So I think the really critical question there is learning from what is happening in New South Wales right now and learning how we can apply that to our own experience because I think this has been a different question in different health systems at different times around the world, you know, given their baseline capacities and the extent to which they've been stressed. And the, the out of hospital thing is also, I guess, you know, to be monitored and evaluated. Our, our models explicitly um, don't think of that. They do um, have, have pathways for people who can't be admitted or, or can't get into ICU and those people might die out of hospital. But, you know, we don't we don't explicitly model all of these alternative care flows that are currently in place to see how people accrue within those. It, it's a simpler representation of the system. So when you get to a so some of the modeling that suggests higher rates of hospitalization, just to be clear, don't take into consideration the fact that care may 
be reduced. Like the level of care may be reduced. No, no. So we have a, you know, a fixed an access and a level of care and a length of stay, and we can report back what that length of stay means for capacity. And even that length of stay has varied over time and, and place. Yeah. Okay. So with the hospital at home program, so are you also suggesting that hospitalizations inc include the people who are kind of pretty sick and they're getting hospital at home treatment or is so that our actually pathways, our pathways are not that complex so our, our pathways um you know have assumptions about people who have a degree of severity of symptoms that would be sufficient to require care and then those people you know can can move through the system in various ways but we don't you know at the time of configuring it um we we did not um, work through the various care pathways that are there now. And we would have trouble, I think, configuring, um, you know, quantitative evidence to support outcomes in those different pathways if we haven't seen them overseas or until we have enough evidence here to see that. Okay, one final question I um, think I have time for. Um, the new Doherty Institute modelling that was presented to Cabinet, I think National Cabinet, last week mm -hmm. that has been um, reported, I think, in The Guardian, and it was reported in The Guardian about the fact that when thousands of cases were seated, if, for example, thousands of cases um, are seated at 70% with the same assumptions about public health measures and testing and tracing, the size of the epidemic increased significantly in um, those words, because the window in time between 70 and 80% coverage is sufficient to allow early epidemic growth from high numbers. What does increase significantly mean? Okay, so, so again, this was all scenario driven and we set up scenarios so we can compare difference. So the scenario that's talking about is with baseline public health and social measures, free range population, some personal protective behaviors and partial TTIQ in place. So what happened in that scenario, you know, we wanted to see where the assumptions would break by seeding the infection at thousands at 70% and given the rate of vaccine rollout in the model, which took another couple of weeks to get to 80%. Um, by the time you got to 80% um, under those conditions, the infections with no restrictions in place had the potential to grow to tens of thousands. And I think that's an important reality check that what we see in New South Wales is actually a controlled scenario. People forget that. Um, because it's how quickly this can grow. So, and at that point, you're entering 80% with tens of thousands of infections. And because the, the epidemic is growing faster, it kind of keeps growing, even though overall things are slowing down. It, it's this overshoot phenomenon that I mentioned. So at that point, that's why we said having stronger suppressions, keeping case numbers more constant, so that you're at a more of a constant level at 80%. From that point on, epidemics were kind of shifted to the left. They were you know, instead of taking a while to take off, they'd come off a little bit earlier. Um, but otherwise, their their um, overall course was much less affected by that seeding number. So it was the adaptive approach was what we were proposing. We have unfortunately run out of time. If I'm going to ask the indulgence of the committee to ask just one final question about whether or not mandatory vaccination for different classes of occupations is an important control measure, particularly while you're transitioning through that 70 to 80% vaccination rate. Was that one of the control measures you looked at? And if so, how important was it? No. So we did not look at that um, in our reporting. So we have our, our model is simplistic. It has vaccination as a widespread measure, um, as all other measures are widespread. All right. Professor, can I thank you on behalf of the entire committee for your evidence today? You have sliced and diced our questions with a degree of frankness and clinical thoroughness that um, for myself has given me further confidence in the, um, the rigours of your, your analysis. And I look forward very much to um, being able um, to see your reports as they progress over the next few weeks. Um, so on behalf of the committee, thank you for your evidence today. Um, thank you for the work and the bringing your expertise to these very, very tricky public policy questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh
That concludes today's hearing of the Public Accountability Committee's COVID-19. Um, I want to thank all members and witnesses for their assistance today um, and we will be terminating the public hearing.